Frank Doden, and I will be uh, chairing the meeting tonight via Zoom. Um, where I'm going to ask the uh, clerk to call the roll, please. Yes, Doden. Here. Styles. Here. Sorry. Thank you, Zaremski. Here. Green. Here. Curlis. Can she un Josue, are, are, is she co-hosted? Laura, I made you co-host, so you should be able to unmute. Okay, I wasn't able to unmute till just this uh, moment, and I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Also present is uh, Village Manager Josue Salmaron, Planning and Zoning Administrator Denise Swinger, and uh, Village Solicitor Brianne Parcels. Also present is Director Johnny Burns. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to review very quickly tonight's agenda. We have uh, a review of minutes from a couple of previous meetings, uh, a quick review of the uh, communications that have been submitted. Uh, uh, Laura and or Josue, will there be a council report tonight? I, I think I'd like to skip it just because it's such a full agenda. Okay. Uh, and then there will be a time uh, uh, called citizens comments those that's a time and i'll uh, emphasize this again at the time that's for making comments about any items that are not on tonight's agenda uh, after that we have three public hearings uh, uh, a conditional use application uh, for the winds cafe a conditional use application for the emporium wines and underdog cafe and then the plan unit development and map amendment rezoning application uh, for the over homes development uh, and then old business, new business, agenda planning, and adjournment. And that will get us through the evening. So we're practically done already, I think. <laughs> All right. Uh, first stuff is just uh, planning commission stuff. Uh, let's quickly review the minutes from the special work session of Wednesday, October 6, 2021. And I will just ask the planning commission members if they have any corrections or changes on a page by page. Uh, so anything on page one, anything on page two or page three. Okay. Then I would move that I would uh, move that we accept the minutes. I second it. All right. Uh, would the clerk call the roll, please? Yes. Zaremski. Yes. Stiles. Yes. Green. Yes. Curlis. Abstain. I wasn't Thank there. You. Thank you, Doden. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second uh, set of minutes to be looked at are for the uh, Tuesday, October 12th, 2021, regular meeting of the Planning Commission. Uh, once again, just go page by page. Any corrections or changes on page one? Page two. Page three. Or page four. Okay, not seeing anything. I'll uh, again move that we approve the minutes for that meeting. I second it. Okay. Uh, would the clerk call the roll, please? Yes, Curlis. Yes. Green. Yes. Zaremski. Yes. Styles. Yes. Doden. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Next thing is just um, you know, just the, the communications that we've re received, which are all officially a part of the packet. Uh, I, do, I don't have the printed out version of the most recent number that we got uh, for communications that came in today. Uh, I think I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but I think there are a few more came in today. Um, and I believe they were all concerning the uh, Ober development. Kind of with uh, people's uh, voicing a variety of concerns about the uh, over development. So, That's correct. You've got 10 total. Yeah, and those are all uh, all part of the public record. And I believe some of the people who wrote letters are also going to participate in the public hearing later on uh, this evening as well. So uh, we'll go on to the, we're skipping the council report again. So now we're up to citizens comments. 
Uh, this is, uh, once again, this is citizens' comments for any items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if you'd like to make a comment about something that's not on the agenda tonight that you want to bring to Planning Commission's attention, uh, you can uh, electronically raise your hand. Uh, usually there's a menu item for it in the, I, th I think in most computers at the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Or you can wave and try to catch somebody's attention. I'll give everybody a few seconds. I've got Second Simon. Turn. Okay. Emily? Hi. Um, I'm Emily Seibel, and I just wanted to say that the, I'm sure you're aware of this, but the meeting is not streaming on YouTube right now, and it looks like there are at least eight or nine people waiting. Um, ah. So just FYI. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Are you in communication about that, Postway? Yes, it is. I verified that it is streaming via Facebook. Okay. Unfortunately, right. we directed people to the YouTube uh, on the agenda. So if we could rectify that, that would be great. We are working on it, Judy. The, the, it was scheduled at 7 p.m., so we have to reissue a new screening session and, uh, to go live. Oh. So what do we do? We wait until that's up and running? Well, the, the meeting is being streamed. It's going Facebook and Channel 5, and it's on Zoom. We've got over 30, we've got 39 people okay. here in total. Um, okay. So there is access uh, to the to the live proceeding. So I think- uh, Is I, there a way to put a message on YouTube or is that a thing? Sorry about my ignorance. Um, it doesn't work like a post, like on Facebook, um, but let me- let me check with uh, with Lacey and uh, see what we can do. And Frank, for, for, our... the, for the purposes of this being live and accessible, it is live. It is accessible. Facebook, Zoom, Channel Five. Frank, in answer to your concern, I would say that the majority of those folks, unless you're seeing someone who's in those first two hearings, they're probably interested in the over hearing. And we have enough time during the first two hearings to make sure that we start that stream going. That's that's what I would guess as well. Um, well, how about if we move on to the uh, first of the public hearings and make sure that at least the the necessary people that are here for the first of the public hearings are here, not on YouTube. Yeah. Um, so. And yeah. frankly, the only other thing I would pipe in to add to that is that if they want to participate, they have to be on Zoom. Okay. We are not taking comments by Facebook or YouTube. Right. right. Okay, so the first uh, public hearing is a conditional use application. Uh, Thomas Gregor, on behalf of the property owner, Mary Kay Smith, has submitted a conditional use application for an expansion of the Winds Cafe outdoor patio at 215 Xenia Avenue. So, uh, Denise, would you like to sure. give us so a, this a is, summary? Uh, this is the, the Winds uh, Cafe. Mm -hmm. um, this is a commercial property um, in the B1 uh, Central Business District. Um, they have, a, they had a temporary outdoor patio expansion that was allowed through the state of Ohio, and, and a lot of people did take that, take advantage of that. Um, and some people then just wanted to go ahead and make that a permanent uh, uh, addition to their properties. And the winds is do actually doing um, some, uh, they're expanding their, their patio area. Uh, they, went, they went ahead and did a survey to make sure that the, um, the placement of the pins was correct. Um, that's a little bit of a problematic area there. You have the corner. Um, where their wine store is. And then there's that little section of a corner that is owned by the village of Yellow Springs. So they were able to, and once they did the um, survey, they created uh, six park on, on-site parking spaces for their staff. And this is simply just an expansion of, of the outdoor patio area. 
and, to, and Thomas Greger, who actually submitted the application on behalf of Mary Kay Smith, is also present here to talk if okay. you have any questions for him. Okay. Uh, do any members of the Planning Commission have any questions about the staff report at this point? Okay. Uh, Thomas, are you there? Let me get Thomas on here. Oh, he's, you're muted, Tomasa. He's muted, so I don't know if that's us muting him or if he's able to unmute himself. We will need to unmute him. Where is Tomaso? I, I have him. How come I can't unmute people? You I'm clicking him and nothing's happening. So he will have to unmute on his end. Um, also, if you hit the space bar on your computer, does that unmute you? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> you think uh, this was our first Zoom meeting, but it's it's not. <laughs> We've had lots of these. We are professionals at this point. <laughs> so, would you like to talk any more about uh, about the pro uh, proposal to my home? Um, I, I don't know if you guys have any questions. I can answer those. But um, basically, we're just expanding the patio that's there. Sorry, my my wife rescued a cat, so now we have it. <laughs> um, uh, we're just expanding the patio that's there um, by about 10 feet on each side. Um, we, we demolished the old patio that was behind the winds that was active, you know, probably 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and that's parking now. Okay. Um, and then uh, eventually we'll put a structure up between the winds and the wine store that's like a gazebo type structure. Th Thomas, the fencing will be the... Uh, um, can you describe what kind of fencing will be around it? Um, on the, so like in line with the wine store, there will be the same kind of fencing. And then in the back, there are going to be um, a lower, like a four foot railing instead of the, instead of the six foot fence. Okay. And the front will stay the same. You know, the, the Zini Avenue side would stay the same. Any other questions from any members of planning commission? Yeah, I wondered Susan. if, if um, there's any plans to put any sort of heaters out there the way some outdoor restaurants have. Um, we haven't gotten that far, but I mean, they, they do have the free hand, the freestanding heaters that run on propane. Um, but if we build a gazebo type structure, it'll have some probably electric radiant heat. Okay. In it. And, and, and there's a plan for a fireplace if, if the budget allows. Any other questions or concerns from Planning Commission? All right, then I will go ahead and open the public hearing. Uh, so if there are any members of the public who'd like to comment on this application, uh, again, uh, you know, hit the button on your screen to raise your hand, or if that doesn't work for you, try to wave your hand to get someone's attention. I'll give people a few seconds to chime in. Am I seeing anything? Not seeing anything. Okay, so that I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to Planning Commission. Any final questions or concerns that anybody has? make a motion to approve the application without conditions per the staff report. Okay, I'll second that. Uh, and would the clerk call the roll, please? Yes, Zaremski. Uh, yes. Green. Yes. Stiles. Yes. Curlis. Yes. Doden. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to myself. Thank you, guys. 
All right, we will move on to the second conditional use application. Kurt Miyazaki, owner of the Emporium Wines and Underdog Cafe, has submitted a conditional use application to serve beer and wine at his establishment and in an existing outdoor patio area at 233 Xenia Avenue. So uh, again, uh, Denise, would you uh, summarize the staff report on this, please? Sure, sure. so um, Kurt and Angela Moore, who's also online, she's the manager up at um, the Emporium, had approached us about um, the fact that they want to start serving beer and wine. And so this is, part of this is a restaurant that's serving um, alcohol is one of the approval processes. Um, they currently, they'll have um, wine tasting samples of wines that they do, but they but people really like to be able to consume a little bit more um, when they're, they're having dinner or just socializing for events that they have there. So they're asking for that. They also already have an existing patio and they wanted to be able to um, have the, the ability to have the uh, beer and wine uh, in an area in the existing patio. Um, they were planning to, at some point in time, uh, the, uh, take out a section of the wall next to the to the um, outdoor patio to have an entrance and exit their door. Um, staff, basically, I went and talked to them, uh, Kurt and had mentioned it to Angela as well, that I, I'm pretty sure that Ohio Department of Liquor requires that fencing be uh, around that patio. Um, and I believe it needs to be locked. Um, so they were gonna check on that. They're here online. I, I did also suggest that he contact Lisa from the YS Brewery to see what she understands about those requirements. That's a problem for, um, them because there is for them to fence that off and do what they want to do then no one would be able to get back to the back of the building for what is going to be uh, soon to be a, a vegan restaurant as well as people being able to access the upstairs apartments from that side of the building so i, I don't know what they can do um there was a suggestion uh, of adora and I know Kurt himself wasn't really a fan of the Dora, but uh, Josue, you mentioned that you could do a Dora if there were like, how many? I'm not sure. Josue, was it four? Four different liquor license? Or is, I don't know if Josue's on. It, it anyway, was but was it four? Yeah. It has to be at least four. At least four, which you would have four on that side of the street with, with um, the Sunrise Cafe the Winds, the um, wine store, and uh, uh, the Emporium. So, I mean, that is something if they find out that, in fact, they can't do that without Adora. I mean, that's obviously something, that's an option they could come back to, but that's really not something we're discussing tonight. I, I still would like to go ahead and, and add in the outdoor patio component in the approval process if they, in fact, take the next step. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any questions or concerns from members of planning commission? Well, this is this is Laura, and I'm I, I think a, a limited Dora right here on this side of the street makes a ton of sense, and I don't think it would affect um, significantly uh, uh, people who are living there because there's all. And you could limit the hours of the Dora too, I suppose. But it would be a shame for both businesses, the one, the vegan restaurant that's going on Keith's Alley um, to kind of cut off that uh, uh, access, which the Emporium so generously offers to the community on their private property. Um, but it's, uh, I think, good for all businesses to have more traffic and, um, but that's up to them. They can fence it off if they like. So I don't see that as an impediment to this application going forward. Thank you. So uh, I have a question about the hours in the application. It says that the Emporium hours are until six o'clock or something. Is that is that going to change with the liquor license? Uh, do we have somebody here uh, either uh, 
Is, is Kurt here? Yeah. They need to be unmuted. Kurt, can you unmute yourself? Yes. 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 Yeah. Presently, we our hours are eight to six, but those are COVID hours. Um, Pre-COVID, we were seven to seven, uh, Monday through Friday or Thursday, and on Friday nights we would have wine tastings that would go till ten o'clock. Okay. Okay. That and you, you would expect those post-COVID hours of uh, or, or, or to get back to those pre-COVID hours eventually. Yes. Yes, that's our goal to get back to those hours. And and are you planning on starting to serve dinner? Uh, at this point. We're mostly breakfast and lunch, so okay. Um, yeah. It, okay. Uh, okay. You could have one of their cheese sandwiches for dinner. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We, or, we would eventually. I mean, if if this were to become a different kind of event uh, on Friday nights, um, food would definitely be a possibility. You know, some kind of uh, um, not a formal dinner, but some kind of food and also with the vegan restaurant opening behind us um that would allow um patrons to uh possibly get food from their restaurant and we would uh most likely allow it on on our in our space so something some arrangement like that okay and also just so i was just there today walking by and so the senior center has a you know they have a ramp there if the ramp was sort of extended or diverted a little you would still have some access into the back and you wouldn't be such a uh, burden to fence off your area there. Yeah. Okay. I, um, this is Gary. I, I have a, a question and, and possible concern. And it's sort of a question for, for Kurt, whether have you guys have, uh, have, have had recently have, have had a survey on the north side of the property? Because my question is, Where's the property line? Because um, because my understanding is most of that area, in fact, that whole area where all those tables are set up, is actually the uh, senior center property, and that your 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 property line only goes, what I had heard, only goes yeah. five or six feet from the building, yeah. and and um, and the only way to resolve that is you know you can't you can't rely on the gis from the you know county but have an actual survey you know find the pins and all that sort of thing so have you done something recently to confirm what's so with, with our with our um what we have uh, in terms of our property and what the senior ha center has in terms of their property lines um like a lot of yellow springs properties they overlap um, and they overlap about evenly. So what we've kind of decided as neighbors, uh, and this was actually um, decided uh, verbally when the senior center put their ramp in, I think about, about a dozen years ago uh, that that ramp uh, was put in for access, uh, is we decided that just basically halfway between the buildings. And that's roughly how the two property lines have overlapped. So that's that's the agreement we have, um, and as you probably know, it's 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 all private property. It's all between the senior center and the, the emporium. There's no yeah. public right. um, access. Kurt, was that agreement recorded when the ramp was uh, put in? No, no. Um, <laughs> yeah. When they decided, when they asked, I mean, we talked about that before they put the ramp in, and we we just decided that, uh, and and the ramp is about halfway, so they came out about half. So that's the edge of the ramp and the, the railing on the ramp is halfway between the buildings. So that's how we left it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I would think if, if, you know, so it's been sort of informal and that's okay. Cause for now, cause most of the, the use of that space in there is relatively informal. But as you're moving in a direction that to be a little more, more formal, in the usage, especially if you're going to have alcohol there, I think it, it would be not just useful, but maybe even necessary to get a more formal agreement with them and just iron something out formally, legally, officially, or whatever. And and if both parties are amenable, that the property line should be established just right smack down the middle. Yeah. Just, you know, 
just do that formally and then um, no one will complain about you putting a fence up <laughs> or or you know or whatever yeah i think that makes that makes sense under these circumstances yeah okay Any other questions or concerns anybody has for Kurt? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, open the public hearing on this. So if there's any members of the public out there who would like to comment on this application, uh, either electronically raise your hand or wave your hand in front of your computer camera. And we'll give people a few seconds to chime in. You seeing anybody, Judy? Okay, I'm not hearing any comments, so we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to Planning Commission. I make a motion that we approve the application. The uh, I think without condition, I, do, I did not understand the staff recommendation because I don't know that we have any control over the per, alcohol permit, you know? Yeah. Well, it's a conditional use to serve alcohol at, at what was considered a permitted restaurant. So that would be the motion. Okay, um, um, and that's the motion. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and I'll second also, that. Oh. Can, I just, can I just read it though? Oh, yes, so go ahead. Make sure okay. you guys get it right. Okay. Yes. Um, the staff recommends approval of the outdoor patio seating in conjunction with the permitted restaurant, along with bars, taverns, clubs, and restaurants serving alcoholic beverages. That's the motion. So I, I have a question in terms of possible conditions, um, yeah, I, but I don't think there needs to be one. The whole condition of whether they need a fence or not the situation whether they need a fence or not. I don't think we need to mention that because that's either that's, they're, they're going to do it or they won't, depending on that. The same with uh, uh, clarifying the property line doesn't seem to be pertinent to the proposal either. That That's just, no. I don't think we need to put that in as a condition per se right. that they resolve that. Yeah, I'm, oh, Gary, that's agree. more in the purview of the Department of Liquor Control. Yeah. And, and staff didn't have any conditions for this. Okay. Okay, so Laura uh, made the motion. I believe I seconded it. Is there any further discussion of the motion? Okay, would the clerk call the roll, please? Perlis. Yes. Doremski. Yes. Green. Yes. Styles, yes. Doden, yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys very much. All right. And thank you. Thank you. Gee. Thank you. <laughs> I just get a kick out of the little messages that show up at the top of my computer. It's suddenly telling me it's Taco Tuesday. <laughs> I'll get rid of that. There we go. <laughs> All right, so now we will move on to the third public hearing tonight, the plan unit development and map amendment rezoning application. Uh, Greg Smith, developer for Oberer Homes, has submitted a PUD application and a map amendment uh, rezoning application for major subdivision. Uh, so move on to this. Denise, would you like to start with uh, the uh, staff summary, please? Sure, um, you know, there's a lot that we're gonna be covering tonight on the, yes. on the development. <laughs> so um, Ober is making a presentation about the proposed development. Okay. So I'm just gonna, I just felt it was necessary um, to give a little bit of a history regarding this property uh, because I'm not sure it's understood by, by people um, why we uh, decided to annex. Um, back in 1974, um, retiring um, Howard Cahill, the village manager, had um, put what uh, some sort of a document that he filed with Greene County. So to allow tap-ins for water and sewer to his property. Um, 35 years later, the property owner at that time, Ken Strewing, then approached the village to um, develop that acreage outside the corporate boundary. 
and approached then village manager Mark Cundiff about exercising his right, you know, to use those tap-ins, but the village uh, refused um, that without annexation. So then be we went into a lengthy legal battle um, and the village eventually lost that lawsuit and tap-ins were required for the area. Um, at some point, <clears throat> Miami Township uh, incorporated into their zoning comprehensive land use plan as that area as a growth area for residential development. Um, and so the choice was over intended to take the 30 acres and follow the Miami Township zoning, which would have been 10,000 minimum 10,000 square foot lots, uh, which would probably have been larger homes. And um, then they'd come to the village for the other portion. Um, it's a total of 52 acres. So um, when Ober reached out to staff, we immediately began talking about annexation because through annexation, we could have some control over the development. And Ober, like I said, Ober did not request um, the annexation. Uh, they didn't even request it at all, let alone for more density. But we really, approach them about that because we didn't want to see the entire 30 acres be um, large lots with larger scale homes. So um, this was an unusual request for Ober because they said that they usually go into communities who really want to see the larger homes catering to people with the higher income levels. Um, so we held an initial meeting with Ober team members along with our council president and vice president Brian House and Marion McQueen were in this meeting, as well as the village manager, Josue, and Johnny Burns, the public works director. Um, we were clear about what, what we wanted to see in this development, including uh, diversity of housing types. Um, we wanted to have a dedicated park area. We wanted to make sure that the development had was walkable and there was connectivity throughout the development. Um, and so, and then we wanted the component of affordable housing, however that was gonna turn out to be. Uh, so this was about a year long process with um, Ober. Um, and this proposed development includes not only single family homes, and it's in three areas, which I'm sure that Greg will share, um, of 64 uh, single family dwellings, but then there's 30, I think it's 33 bedroom duplex units, 22 two bedroom duplex units, and then something which was a new thing for them, um, which we had proposed some sort of type of row housing, they have, um, they're proposing now to build seven uh, buildings that are what they call townhomes, which would include um, a total of 24 units. Um, there's gonna be just slightly under an acre um, of a playground park area that they are donating um, along with they're gonna put the playground equipment on it. Um, and that will be, we, we requested that that be an area that could also um, be accessible to the existing neighborhoods. So you'll see on the plan where that, where that is um, positioned at on the property. Um, along with, there's about a 2.2 wooded area um, for park, which the public works may later develop for use by residents. Um, Johnny was looking at the possibility of connecting <clears throat> from that park area, um, maybe through an easement with the property owner uh, next that uh, owns Calypso Grill to maybe be able to have an access to our main sidewalk, which would lead you on to the downtown area. Um, and then there's also the 1.75 acre donation of land for affordable housing, which um, could under the zoning, uh, which is PUD, but it has the RC underlying zoning, uh, could provide up to 24 units or more if the developer for that property requests increased density, it could be you know more than the 24 under the PUD zoning. Um, let's see, there, the walkability and the connectivity is featured throughout the development with sidewalks that are gonna be along both sides of the streets and also connecting multimodal pathways, um, six feet wide, they're gonna make those of concrete. So to enable people to walk into the constructed wetland area, the detention areas and over to the park. Um, another question that I've saw in 
I, you know, a lot of the letters came in kind of late, so I'm not able to really address all those, but the infrastructure for this development is not gonna be paid for by the village. The, it is gonna be paid for by the de developer over. Um, so that's really not an issue. Um, there is the capacity for utilities to the site and Johnny Burns is online if any questions Planning Commission may have about that. Um, and as well as uh, any questions from the engineers that helped design that uh, stormwater system there online as well. There's another big concern that people have with traffic and we do have OBRS traffic engineer online to answer any Planning Commission questions relating to that traffic impact study. Um, I just want to close by just saying this development could have been constructed under straight RC zoning uh, because the layout of the lots and setbacks for the single family dwellings meet the RC zoning. In fact, for the most part, could have probably been under RB zoning. But RC is a connecting area, so you can either do um, RA or RC, and we chose the RC because RA doesn't allow anything but single family dwellings, and we really wanted to have those mix of types, such as duplexes in the row housing and anything possibly in the future. So that's pretty much my little summary uh, because Ober does have a PowerPoint presentation that they want to make. So Frank, I'll turn okay. it back to you. Okay, thank you, Denise. And then just, uh, I'm just going to uh, step back a little bit and just talk, uh, talk to everybody out there about what the basic process is going to be. Uh, PUDs are, are pretty complicated things, and I'll, I'll try to clear, keep things as clear as possible as we're working through. Uh, but the basic structure for right now is we've just heard the staff report. The next thing we're going to do is uh, ha ask the members of the Planning Commission if they have any specific questions about the staff report for Denise. And as soon as we're done with that, and if there are no questions, then we'll move on to the presentation by the applicant. And uh, Planning Commission will be able to ask questions of the applicant. And then only after the applicant that made the presentation and the Planning Commission has uh, uh, question the applicant about that presentation, then we'll open, uh, then we'll have a public hearing. And uh, members of the public who want to comment on this will have the opportunity to do so at that point. When the public hearing closes, it'll come back to the, uh, the planning commission and the applicant to discuss any issues that may have come up as a result of the public hearing. And then at the end of uh, that process, it'll finally come back to the planning commission where we will go through the, what is a, a pretty, complicated voting process for uh, uh, PUDs. So that fairly clear to everybody, Susan? I have a question about the unnamed creek for Denise that I, because this was in, I think maybe a couple of the letters. It, was there any sort of study done or environmental assessment? Should there be anything done? Um, I'm not an engineer, so, uh... That would I would rather defer that to over. Okay. Any other questions for Denise at this point? All right, then I will invite. Is it uh, uh, Greg Smith? I assume Greg's here. Is that who's making the presentation? Should be. Okay. Okay. Greg, are you there? I believe you're here, Frank. Is he coming in? Oh. There we are. Okay, I can see you now. All right, well, let's um, see if my screen will come up here now. Um, hit the share screen button. All right, Frank, can you see the uh, screen up on your monitor? Yes, I can. Can everybody else see it? Is there anybody who can't see it? All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank Denise for her um, staff report and giving a little bit of the history here. That saved me from going through some stuff. Um, my name is Greg Smith. I'm a developer with the Ober Company. I've been with the Ober Companies about 20 years now. I'm here tonight with George Ober Jr. He is the uh, CEO and president of the Ober Companies, um, son of the original founder 75 years ago, 76 years ago now, that's right. Um, we are also joined by Jeff Putoff and Mike Gottenmaker, both from Choice One Engineering. Uh, Jeff is our civil engineer, um, be able to answer questions such as stormwater, sanitary water, those types of questions. 
And Mike is the uh, traffic engineer. He'll be able to answer any questions people might have regarding the road improvements and what impact our development may have on the neighborhood and surrounding as far as traffic goes. Um, I also would like to, before I get started, point out something that Denise pointed out already, but to kind of you know, put it out there, Ober already owns this land. We've owned it for just about a year now. Um, it is zoned RA, and hence we could and are willing to go forward with a single family development on the property. We would not need a rezoning to do so. Um, we're here tonight because after many discussions with the village, we think a cooperative plan unit development would be a better option for all parties. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the benefits I think the PUD option offers um, the, the space, the development creates, I think, a, a more comprehensive neighborhood development that uh, has a lot of benefits over a single family traditional RA type development. Um, so with that, I'll kind of start going through our slides here a little bit, kind of gave you a description of who the Overt companies are. I uh, just want to kind of mention that, you know, we've been here in the Dayton, greater Dayton area for our entire uh, legacy of 75 years. And we don't get much out of Green, Montgomery and Warren County areas. Um, a lot of development companies are, you know, multi-state, you know, very large <laughs> organizations. Um, we are still local and, uh, we appreciate being local in that, um, you know, we know the communities you work in, but we have many projects that we do over and over again in the communities you work in. So it's important for us to uh, have a, a longstanding reputation and, uh, and, and move forward in a, in a way that allows us to continue to work in these communities. Uh, the site we're looking at is a little over 50 acres, I think it's 52 acres. Um, located on the south side of um, Yellow Springs. Uh, it was annexed in earlier this year. Um, some of it has, was already in Yellow Springs, but the, the additional acreage to the south was annexed and it is all currently zoned A1, I'm sorry, R1, RA, I'm sorry, ah, my bad. Um, the comprehensive plan for the uh, village does call this area out as appropriate area for for future development. One of the things we do early on um, when we acquire a piece of property, or even when we look to acquire a piece of property is we do a, a very detailed evaluation of the existing conditions. I'm gonna go over some of those just because I think it's important for everybody to understand what those are to understand what our decisions were going forward on how this property is being proposed to be developed. First of all, there is an existing sanitary sewer trunk line which cuts through this property, follows this blue dotted line through here. That sewer has been there since the uh, 60s as far as we can tell. And uh, as um, Denise pointed out, it does have the capacity for additional um, houses to be attached to it. There's also a water line that ends currently in Southgate Avenue and a second water line that goes down to the land. Um, both of those also have capacity for additional residential connections. Um, the property itself has some very unique conditions. Um, the area over here to the far west has a, a shallow rock. It's only about four feet deep. So that area is a little bit sensitive to, to basements. Um, the area here to the northeast has um, some topo conditions. Um, it's a very steep area that kind of comes into the existing neighborhood here. The area in the pink seems to be an area that somewhere along in the past, um, some unsupervised fill was placed here, um, which also creates a condition we need to be aware of when developing it. You, you know, it has to be something that when building, building in this area um, is done so in a way that, uh, you know, the poor soils are mitigated, and that's about four feet deep. As mentioned earlier, there is a creek which runs along the entire west side of the neighborhood. Um, I do want to point out we have done um, studies on this creek and in fact have already submitted a permit and been approved for a permit to the Ohio EPA and the Corps of Engineers. Um, a small impact is going to be needed to be made to the creek um, to continue Southgate Avenue. Basically right now Southgate Avenue has a storm sewer which is kind of 
un unabatingly releases into that creek and we are going to uh, fix that situation. That, that was a uh, design that was provable in the 60s would definitely not be something that they would allow a developer to do today. Um, so that, that, that is the only impact that we've made to the creek is uh, fixing that storm sewer and continuing Southgate Avenue South. Other than that, there will be no impacts to the creek. And like I said, we've already been approved by the Corps for the one small impact um, we are going to make and it should actually improve the situation there. Um, see, and finally, the road connections. So right now there is a dead end south gate, kind of just dead ends into the property. And then Spillan is an unimproved, unwidened road anyway, um, along this property line. And here's our proposed uh, PUD plan. It contains, as Denise alluded to, a, a mixture of residential uses. It'll be solely residential. Um, no commercial uses are being proposed. The uh, brownish uses here are single family. These are the uses that would be permitted under the existing zoning. If turned down you know, through this process, over would proceed with an entire plan of these brownish uh, single family lots. What the PUD plan um, allows is a, a large variety. Most notably, um, the duplexes here will have two different types of duplexes, which I'll share in a little bit here, but essentially this cul-de-sac will be three bedroom duplexes, and this cul-de-sac will be two bedroom duplexes, kind of a different price range. Um, the townhome areas, you see the, oh, by the way, go back to the comment on the existing infrastructure. These duplexes are being placed in this location as they are on top of the shallow rock area. So these duplexes will have slab um, foundations, no basements. And as such, they will not have to be dug into that shallow rock. Um, the area to the West of those duplexes, we are proposing to use a constructive wetland. Um, we think this is a creative idea to uh, resolve some stormwater to coming off the site in an area of shallow rock, as opposed to a pond, which again would require digging into a shallow rock. Um, we are proposing a constructed wetland. It'll treat the um, stormwater very similar in a way to a pond would have, but in this case, we'll create a um, open space, a little bit of habitat, and uh, some space for some uh, some nice plantings and things, making a nice attractive backyard for some of these duplexes. And that'll be available for people to uh, transverse through the trails that are proposed to go through there as well. Uh, Frank, is my screen still being shared? Yes, I believe so. Uh, we had somebody here in our office believe otherwise, so I just want to ask. Okay. Yeah, no, I can still see. Can can everybody else still see it? I can see it. Okay. Yes, okay. I see it. Yes. Can you see it? All right, well, okay. that's good. Um, as Denise alluded to, too, through the discussions with the um, the village, we are um, providing acreage to the village as a donation, which the village will then use to develop affordable housing. Ober will not play a direct role, at least not initially, on how that uh, acreage is used. We may actually submit a proposal, but that'll be up to the village on how that acreage is used and, and how that, which proposals ended up being identified for the affordable housing component. Um, utilities, this is a kind of a basic utility plan, which kind of shows a little bit of what's going on. Again, you have the storm, the sanitary sewer, I'm sorry, which already runs through the site. It'll show the water line, which will essentially follow the street grid. It does pretty efficient layout for stormwater. You'll see that it has three watersheds. Um, the one watershed is already mentioned. I'll we'll go back to this um, constructed wetland that we are gonna create. The other two watersheds are a little bit smaller and they're gonna go to new ponds that will be created. Both ponds will have fountains and uh, under the uh, Village code, you know, will be considered amenities. Uh, Village expressed to us early on how important, you know, pedestrian connectivity and pedestrian accesses were. 
and we took this to heart. The two pictures to the right are uh, existing older communities where we've done this type of thing before in the past, so it's not new to us. Um, and you can see the top arrow shows the uh, proposed path through the uh, donated park. Um, the arrows to the middle and to the east show you know, pedestrian connections to the wetland and then out to Spillane Road. Also, I should fair to mention that the entire community will have sidewalks on both sides of the street through internally. And then we are proposing improving the west side of Spillane Road um, to include curb and sidewalk on the west side. So um, that'll give uh, much more walkability in this community, in this neighborhood than what had previously existed. Um, open space preservation. You know, under the straight RA zoning, there is no requirement for open space. Under the PUD zoning, there is. Uh, I believe there's a 15% requirement. Uh, we are proposing something closer to 22%. Um, our open space preservation not only preserves the park up in the uh, north part of the section, which will be donated to the village, um, along with some playground equipment, which I'll share later. Um, it also includes preserving the entire creek, with the exception of where Southgate Avenue crosses into the neighborhood. Um, preserving the woodlands along the creek, as you can see there, and then preserving some tree lines up along Hyde Road down on the uh, southern border. We do need to put a detention in that area, but our intention is to preserve the trees along Hyde and then up against the neighbor, um, which abuts this property to the uh, west. There's a just preliminary landscape plan. Um, every home will you know, be provided with a street tree. Um, we had some discussions early on with the uh, um, staff and the planning commission about these trees. And um, we are made some accommodations to allow the street trees to go in and I think survive and do well. I'll go over those in a little bit. But essentially, in addition to the street trees and the tree preservation, we are proposing some buffers up along the row housing sections. So if you can see the light yellow, on the backyards there, there are buffer areas of trees in there. Um, you can also start to see the park take shape there in the top right, we'll get some more details on the park. We hope to work with the village to pick out exactly what equipment um, will be provided to the park, but this is what we're doing in a similar community. Um, as you can see, it's a uh, swing set with a park bench. Um, a multi-purpose type gym with slides, climbing walls, tunnels. You know, these are the types of things we like to provide in our playgrounds and parks. Um, it's not too unique for us to donate parks to uh, villages or cities. We've done it before in the past. Um, we've donated uh, parks here in Washington Township near our office to the uh, Centerville Washington Township Park District and found that to be a win-win type situation. You know, We get to provide a park um, for our residents to use and enjoy, and the community as a whole, i.e. the park district, gets a park um, for the rest of the community to use and enjoy. So um, it's kind of a win-win situation when we can find a cooperative park district to uh, you know, accept our donation and uh, take a park in. One of the uh, things we've heard from a number of folks you know, leading up to tonight was concerns about traffic. And by definition, one more house is more traffic. Um, so we understand those concerns, uh, but we did do a traffic impact study of the neighborhood. What we found was, you know, this area of Yellow Springs does not have a traffic problem now, and it will not have a traffic problem when over is done with our development. Um, it is very well served um, through a couple different access points. Um, Essentially, we found that the 100 trips during the AM peak hour and 130 trips during the PM peak hour were about what to expect out of our new development. And that those uh, trips will add a delay of three to seven seconds at the full build out year 
for the intersection, creating a total delay of nine seconds to get out of the intersection. Uh, essentially, you know, nine seconds, it's an A intersections now, and it'll be A intersections when we're done. It just it's not enough additional traffic to, to cause a backup. And uh, based on the analysis done on these uh, reports, no offsite improvements, you know, turn lanes or those types of things were deemed as warranted by the uh, civil engineer. Uh, I'd like to point out, you know, the choice one uses a nationally uh, approved standard when preparing these um, traffic studies. So it's not something that over has much input in to what the results are or aren't. Um, the standards basically count the number of cars, they do a, a traffic count, they take into consideration delays as existing, and, uh, and then it kind of puts out a mathematical solution. So it's not something that, that I can have much input on uh, the results. I also want to point out pedestrian traffic. Uh, this neighborhood is excellent for pedestrian connectivity. It is only about a mile from downtown. Uh, it has a lot of points of interest that are walkable. Um, and I think that a lot of our residents will choose pedestrian or bicycling as at least an alternative motive sometimes for their traffic points. Uh, this is a new slide. Some of you have seen this presentation before. I added this slide just because um, I think it helps answer some of the questions I've received before on how folks will get in and out of the community. So we see and have studied two major points of ingress, egress into the community. Basically, if folks are heading north towards town, they will continue up on Southgate Avenue and turn by the Dollar General Store onto, I believe it's Cahill Avenue, and then go up onto the uh, main state route there. Um, yeah, that destination's that route would be probably the most popular way out of the community. Uh, the second way out of the community would be through the south that would head on to Spillane, go to Spillane to this intersection here on um, Hyde Road and continue on Hyde over to 68 at this intersection. Uh, we see that as a secondary access. Really the reason people would use this access is going south towards Xenia. Um, and then again, that use would, uh, would come here to this intersection here in Hyde. We do not see a whole lot of trips anticipated coming back through the neighborhoods. There really isn't a large destination point to the east that would drive trips through the existing neighborhood roads. I um, mean, not saying people wouldn't go to visit friends or occasionally go there, but the massing of the trips would be by Dollar General and out 68 or down high and out to 68. This is also a new slide from what we had previously presented in some of the earlier presentations. We are proposing three different types of roads. I think this is in a response to some of the comments we've heard. Uh, the first one is the wider road. This is basically a cross section of the existing Southgate Avenue. So we would propose extending Southgate Avenue from its existing terminus into our property, then essentially turning east out to Spalam with basically the same road section you currently have on Southgate. So this would be a uh, you know, somewhat wider road, neighborhood road anyway, with uh, five foot tree lawns on each side. We are intentionally making the tree lawns wider so that we can keep the trees to survive in there. So we gave those tree lawns an extra foot from the four foot that would be traditional. And uh, we've got to give a higher survival ability of the trees along that tree lawn. Then in the secondary streets that run through our neighborhood, we were actually proposing a somewhat narrower street. Um, the second street there, you can see that would meet the Greene County subdivision requirements. So we built the narrower street before. In fact, that is the width of the streets in our uh, Nathaniel's Grove and Oak Brook subdivisions. But by being a little bit narrower, it will um, essentially lead to slower traffic uh, in those cul-de-sacs and, uh, and give a, you know, a chance for cars to go a little slower through that area. As you can see, we're gonna keep the sidewalks at the back of the right-of-way, the right-of-way would be the same 50-foot right-of-way as required by the subdivision ordinance. 
but we're given seven foot tree lines in that area. And that'll give even more room for trees to continue to survive and do well in the tree line. Um, and then the final diagram down there on the bottom is our proposal to improve Spillane Road. So Spillane exists. And what we are going to do is do a widening. The widening will be about four and a half feet to the west on our side of the property line. Um, it'll include a roll curve, just like the rest of the streets within the neighborhood, a uh, five foot tree lawn, similar to uh, the one along um, the South Gate, and then a four foot sidewalk along our side of, of Spillane. So that kind of gives the, the Spillane improvements proposals and then there'll be some homes on that Spillane Road, which face Spillane and out to Spillane, which make that feel like a neighborhood street, um, as opposed to you know a lot of suburban subdivisions actually back homes up to the street. And we really didn't want to do that in this case. We thought it, since Spillane had homes that fronted to it uh, in the village, that'd be most proper for us to continue that pattern of development, have homes that front on Spillane. And here's some more detail about the type of homes you're proposing. Uh, this is a repeat slide. Some folks have seen this before, but as I said earlier, we'll have single family homes um, in the areas on the south um, east corner. You see the ones that are facing Spillane now. There's going to be a, looks like eight or nine homes there the front on Spillane. Uh, many of the other homes will be interior to the community. The area to the north um west where i mentioned had some of the unsupervised fill those will also be single family homes all those homes will be on basements and what that will do is allow us to uh, put the footers for the homes down below where the unsupervised fill is and, and that'll essentially mitigate that that concern and again the duplexes are over where the shallow rock area is and then you can see the village controlled uh, um, affordable housing in the northeast corner of the site, and that'll be donated to the village. And here's what some of the homes will look like. So the two pictures on top are pictures of a three bedroom duplex. The two bedroom duplex is gonna look very, very similar. The only difference is it'll have a one car garage as opposed to a two car garage on that elevation. And then the picture below is our townhome concept. We're still working through this a little bit, the townhomes. But the goal was, again, to provide a different price point for the townhomes, something that could come in a little less expensive than some of the uh, duplexes or single family homes and uh, make the uh, neighborhood um, more economically diverse. And then over homes. So I'll give you a little history of over homes. Um, you know, we've been building single family homes for most of our history and have traditionally had a number of products. And then back in the day, we're more of a track builder. And once the uh, recession hit about 10 years ago, we started to change our model a little bit. And today we build a semi-custom home. These semi-custom homes give us and our customers a lot of uh, benefits. They, when somebody comes into an over a model, they can choose from uh, I think we're up to 40 some different home plans. Um, and then all the alterations and modifications that are traditionally offered for those plans, elevation changes, uh, each plan has probably three or four different elevations. So, you know, looking at our plans, you probably have up to hundred different elevations to choose from. The semi-custom part is what is unique to Ober these days in that we have our own in-house designers. So in addition to picking out from the plans you'll see available to you, um, we can make changes to those plans and often do, that those little customizations make the homes more um, usable, user-friendly for the residents who are buying them, and also give a little even more diversity to the, uh, to the neighborhood street pattern in that you know, the changes that a, a customer might make um, you know, often is to the exterior of the home and making it a, a more diverse neighborhood. So I'm going to go through some of these slides. Um, but like I said, mind you, each home is available in probably four different elevations. And what do we got about 
10 different color schemes now? Oh yeah, and there's at least 70 color schemes. And most of the homes have uh, as many as five different exterior looks to them. Uh, some with front porches, some not, some with stone, some with brick, et cetera. So we're very proud of the, of the fact that, you know, when the over gets done, the uh, community will, will have a large diversity of, of elevations and housing styles. And going through some of these, coming most of my two car garages, some of three car garages, an option. We have both uh, patio homes, single story and two story products, even some split levels. Um, one of the questions that came up, um, I believe during some of the workshop sessions was some concern about lighting at night. There was a desire not to have light pollution. So in order to take that you know, concern to heart, I just took a couple pictures of three over our homes at night. These pictures are taken about nine o'clock in the evening um, before we switched our clocks anyway. Um, so I guess it's eight o'clock this time. And uh, as you can see, all the houses will have a pole light up front. Um, the pole light's purpose is to, uh, you know, kind of light the entry to the home a little bit. Um, you know, maybe provide just a little light to the sidewalk, but not, not intended to flood the sidewalk. Um, there'll be lights on the garage, you know, mostly just intended to help folks in and out of their cars to see the front porch or see it get into the garage. And then there'll be lights on the front porch itself. But as you can see, there is almost no spill. So these lights are residential in style and standard and in wattage and you know, should not considerably contribute to light pollution in the sky or into the neighbor's lawns or yards or areas. Um, it's very, very low lighting. We are not proposing street lights or any kind of uh, large um, commercial lighting in the neighborhood, just, just the lighting like you see here in these pictures. And then uh, these are also new slides to this presentation. You know, Brianna, not Brianna, sorry, sorry, Denise asked me to kind of give some existing pictures so we can get a feel for the materials. And as George alluded to, here's some of the material pictures. As you can see, we often uh, mix and match materials in our elevations. Very rarely will an elevation just have one material. Um, often there are at least two or three um, material types in, a, in an elevation. Um, you can see the patio home there in the top left, um, you know, intended for more of a um, single story living. And then you can see some of the two story homes here on the rest of those pictures on this particular slide. Uh, this slide includes some of the larger single story homes. We do have some very large single story homes. Some of our, our customers are really starting to like these days. Um, in many cases, these will have finished basements, which you know, offer some bonus space. And then another two story up there at the top right. And with that, I just kind of want to do a summary. So again, you know, as we close the developer portion of this uh, presentation, you know, I think I want to remind everybody that the goal for this plan is really to decide whether the PUD we've worked with the village staff on represents a better development option than a, than a full single family um, development. And you know, remind everybody that the PUD does present a, a large number of benefits, um, including the open space, the donated park, the affordable housing space in the uh, north um, east corner, um, the variety of housing and housing price points through the uh, single family, the two bedroom duplex, the three bedroom duplex, and the, and the townhomes, I think we're very proud that we've been able to offer such a variety uh, of housing types. And uh, just kind of let everybody know that our goal would be to uh, you know, go through this process with the village through approval in the spring. So we could be under construction maybe in the uh, May time period and be selling homes this summer. Uh, the soonest we could see anybody having occupancy would probably be early 2023. Um, the development itself is likely a five to six year build out period. And of course, that just depends a lot on what the market is and uh, how, how strong it really goes through these sales. But uh, we anticipate this to take you know, five to six years to, uh, to develop. And with that, 
uh, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Frank to uh, open up the next section of the meeting. Okay, thank you very much, Greg. At the you gotta close down your screen sharing. There we go. All right, so at this point, uh, I wanna bring it back to uh, members of the Planning Commission uh, to see if any of them have any questions that they'd like to ask uh, Greg following his presentation. Um, I got yeah. some questions, so okay. uh, just a couple things. So. Some of the some of the things talk about uh, detention basins, and some talk about retention. These are actually going to be retention. They're going to have standing water in them. That's the plan. Actually, both. So the two ponds will have standing water and fountains. Okay. And then the constructed wetland um, will be a. Um, detention area. So we'll not have standing water in the constructed well. The okay. intention is for the water to uh, pass through at a at a rate um, appropriate for the treatment of the water, but not to have long-term standing water. Okay. And then the um, all the houses are going to be uh, built to order, or they're going to be spec houses? or And how does that work with a duplex? Do you have to have two people buy the you know, ready to buy them, or how does that all work? Um, so, yeah, George is whispering some of the answers into my ear here, <laughs> but uh, both the answer to that question. So, um, Ober does traditionally do a number of market homes in our communities. These are homes that we will build on spec and then sell either during the construction process or after their fleet. Um, we also do a lot of homes to order. Um, that are when a customer comes in, you know, they'll pick out a vacant lot and go from, from, from the vacant lot through the entire process. The, uh, so those are both single family. The duplexes will also kind of be both. Um, so if we, we'll probably proceed with one or two uh, spec duplexes, you know, both sides. But if we get a customer who's looking to uh, build a duplex and we have enough faith that we could sell the other side, we could build, um, you know, the entire building, obviously, with half of it being sort of custom and the other half being being a spec that will be sold later on. So it, whether we do that largely just depends on how the market's doing and how many specs we currently have. Um, obviously, if I got three or four vacant um, duplexes that haven't sold yet, I'd be a little hesitant to do so on spec. But if they're selling well, and and you know we'd have to make that decision when the time came, I guess. Okay. And then I, the last question I had is about the well, fences. Answer one of my questions. So we yeah. usually keep about a half a dozen specs at a time open. So you know we would we would not be uncommon for us to have um, half a dozen spec units available at a time for uh, for anybody to come in and just buy a unit on spec versus start from scratch. Okay. And then the last question I had was about the fences. It sounds like you're saying that for the duplexes, the people won't be able to uh, put fences on their yards because the, the mowing is going to be paid for by the homeowners association. Is that how you've done this in the past? Yeah. Just... So we did, we've had different, um, different modes, but usually we find that the uh, folks who are most interested in the duplexes and townhomes, um, also benefit or would appreciate benefit from some additional level of service. Um, okay. So one of the levels of service that we would intend to offer is um, lawn mowing and snow shoveling. Okay. Um, so that would be offered through the HOA over, um, really would just work as a pass through in that. So essentially what that is, you know, we don't make any money on lawn mowing, um, but we would hire a lawn mowing company and the folks who, who live in the townhomes and would contribute a, a little bit more to their HOA fees. And those fees then would go to pay for that lawn mowing company to mow their grass and, uh, and shovel the snow on the sidewalks and driveways. And like I said, just a little additional level of service. The uh, only real downside of that is the fencing. Uh, you know, we'd have to enable the uh, common mowing company to have access to those areas so we don't traditionally allow fencing 
on the duplexes or townhome products for that purpose. Okay. I just, it just, uh, I mean, it just, it caught my eye because I just, you know, uh, um, um, the idea of somebody, you know, coming through the backyard and also if you put in a swing set or a sandbox, I don't know that it, you're still going to have a complicated mowing program. We, so. we, we do have a lot of times swing sets show up and those aren't really too big of an issue to mow around. Um, a lot of times also residents will put in additional landscaping and we uh, allow that with the understanding that, hey, look, if you guys want to put in, uh, you know, more landscaping in this duplex slot than what we traditionally over would, that's fine. It's just, you know, usually the, tr the resident's responsibility to take care of that additional landscaping. Okay, thank you. Yes, Susan. I had a question about energy features. Now, I'm sure like appliances and that, you're, there's a requirement that they have to meet certain energy guidelines. But I'm wondering in your construction, do you have any energy saving features or can people request those features? Yeah, the answer is yes to both. Um, we already standardly put in uh, like an R21 wall and an R42 ceiling. So the, the houses are heavily insulated with all, of course, insulated windows and doors. We offer uh, high energy efficient, highly energy efficient furnaces and water heaters. Uh, but it's not uncommon, and we have had folks that'll that'll opt for, for instance, for geothermal. Or, or sometimes even try to upgrade to even a higher efficiency than, than the 97% that we already offer. But the homes are very, the, the homes already come very energy efficient. And just as a follow-up, are, so are these stick-built houses or are any of them ICFs? Um, primarily what we do is stick-built houses. Sometimes we will build panels of, of walls in the factory and ship the panels out. But because of the labor and the supply chain issues right now, uh, we're building as many stick building houses as we ever have. And is there an option for any family to have solar? Um, we've entertained that for, particularly for water heaters and things of that nature, but, um, but we're open to that. Thank you. We found that not to be very popular with the new construction, only because of the payback. And, the, and, the, the, and it also depends upon the tax credits that are prevalent at the time uh, as to how attractive that is to the home buyer. One thing we definitely would do would be pair somebody up with a contractor who specializes in that. Because again, it changes so much that we want to make sure that people are getting, you know, Rather than let's take a 10% cut or whatever, yeah, just here, here's a guy who knows what, how to get your benefits and how to get your tax credits and those types of things off that. So, if, if I can interject, um, uh, we also, the village, because we own our own electric, we have our own electric company basically as one of our enterprises, we do have a small power production permit program. So people can always come later and add solar and we have uh, by, by um, directional meters that can be installed. That is a very unique uh, component and uh, something we'll work with the village to learn about. Other members of Planning Commission, any questions? Yeah, this is Laura Curlis. On Laura. that point, I, I've installed solar on my garage roof, and I had uh, Green County uh, made me have a structural engineer come out to make sure it could support it, the weight. So are your roofs constructed um, in a way that that will not be an issue for the homeowner? Uh, we use pre-engineered uh, trusses, so I would imagine they would hold most panels, I mean, obviously, they're not unlimited in their in their uh, construction, but uh, I wouldn't imagine use it be a problem unless you come with something really, really heavy. We have not run into that so far. Okay. Another question about electric. Will the electric be buried? Yes. yes. All the utilities through the neighborhood are intended to be underground. 
and and are any utilities underground in the tree lawns? No, uh, the way that's another reason why I, I did share that uh, that section with you. Um, we, after the discussion we had at the workshop session, we kind of took that back a little bit and uh, improved upon our, our our street section. We made the tree lawns a little wider uh, to kind of give more room for the trees in the tree lawns, and then intending on putting the utilities on the back side of the sidewalks. Um, in a utility easement outside of the tree lines. And uh, Den maybe this is for Denise. Nothing would prevent the tree committee from working with the village or with Ober to correctly uh, put trees in the right place and the right type in the tree lawn. No, there isn't anything to prevent that. In fact, we, we explained to Ober that we do have a recommended tree list um, and, um, you know, we do have a tree committee, so they, they were already planning on using Ohio native <clears throat> plants and trees and we could, and we will, um, in the final plan, we'll get that, we'll get the final details of the landscaping plan with them. I and just want to make, preliminary. I want to make sure nothing prevents the use of the tree lawn because if the right tree is chosen it wouldn't do things like pull up sidewalks or cause problems right. so it's like I said, we did we did take to heart some of the comments during the workshop session i think it was one of the ones shared with us yeah. and, and we agree um so we did a little bit of widening of the tree lawns and and uh, i believe we did some changes to our landscape plan uh based on the information that denise provided so uh i, I appreciate the input that was given to the workshop session. And I think, I hope that the commission sees some of our changes as, as being reflective of that. I have, a qu qu I have a lot of questions. I have questions about the width of the streets, uh, the extension of Southgate, and then I don't know what you're calling the street that has the ingress and egress from Spillane, but are those two streets gonna be the wider design, the 31 foot design? Yes, ma'am. And is a 31 foot design enable two way traffic with parking on street? Both designs will enable two way traffic with parking on street. The difference is how fast those cars may be coming. Uh, so, you know, what would happen on most neighborhood streets is if you have a car parked on each side of the street, and you got two cars coming two ways, somebody's gonna have to yield um, while you know the one car goes around and the other car goes around. That's the way my streets and my neighborhood are set up. And that that's nice in some ways in that it slows down traffic through those streets. Um, so we are proposing the narrower streets you know, the, the, on the cul-de-sacs and even to slow it down even more. But like I said, I wanna point out that the, the cross section we are proposing for uh, Southgate is the existing cross section. So what you see there today is what you will have continued on South. And then the cross sections in the cul-de-sacs is not really unique either. It is per Greene County's um, subdivision code, which I believe is the village mimics in many ways. And uh, that allows for a little narrower street to even slow that traffic down even more. Um, what you tend to find if you build wider streets, people just drive faster. Um, so the narrower streets have the benefit of slowing down traffic. Uh, the reason I ask is the South Gate is on our active transportation plan. Um, and I don't know if that's good or bad to have one of these designs. I mean, you say it slows it down, but it can also be problematic for cyclists if there's always a jockeying uh, about who has to stop to yield to somebody else if there's also parking. I mean, it's designed now, so there's probably no changing it, but that that is on our active transportation plan. I have another question about the, will we require the, at the Northern Park, the pedestrian or bike access over to Calypso, will we require that to be a paved stub and stubbed out trail? 
that, that's something in the future that it would be up to public works to do because that isn't over land and we would have to get into some kind of agreement with the owner of Calypso Grill. I, I know that, but you know, if this were a street, we might require the developer to stub it out at the place where we expect it to carry carry on when it when the opportunity arises. It is our intention to pave that trail. Okay. Um, and does this, Denise, does this development meet our complete streets plan and policy? Yes. Does it meet our open space requirement? And what I mean by that is it is typical, many developers want to count their detention retention areas as open space, although residents often don't consider it meaningful open space, but it, do you believe this meets our requirements? Well, it meets the requirements that's in the PUD because they're, because they're gonna have fountain features, which is kind of normal in their development. That, and that allows it for recreational use and with the um, pathways to get to those, that can be counted as part of the, part of the open space, yes. Um, the other thing, we don't, as far as I know, don't yet have any dark skies policy or ordinance, although I'm a big supporter of that. And uh, I looked very closely at your exhibit M and uh, in, in my opinion, this would these fixtures are, unfortunately they're typical, but I would not call them dark skies because the lamp posts, unless you get a certain design of a, a head on the lamp post, it radiates light outward directly at the eye versus downward. So I would be interested, Denise, in every fixture being 90 degree cutoff. And it's also true of the outdoor lights on on the garages and um, anything that isn't under a roof. Uh, any outdoor lighting on the garage is 90 degree cutoff downward directional. And that's, I think that's it for, for my notes. Um, I, I, uh, I think it does meet our Di diversity of types of housing. I think there um, that some, and we've had comments about the design, although I understand why you say these, there is a variety of designs here from um, those who are more into architectural types. They might say there's there could be more diversity in that, but it is your products uh, are what they are. And we don't, Denise, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't currently have any design standards. Is that correct? Not really. I mean, we, we have some ar architectural, I mean, but they're not, they don't get that specific. Right. Um, and some of those uh, relate to, if you're asking for more modifications to things, like modifications to the minimum requirements or to the size, um, which they're not asking for. I mean, then that's where you might get into other things like cool roof technology and those kind of features. Thank, thank you. So, Brianne, can I ask a question at this point? Sure. Uh, so, Laura's made a suggestion slash request. It's not a motion. I, I don't know where to put it in the scheme of things, and I don't know how it gets presented to Ober because it's not a requirement of the PUD. What do, what do we do? Right. Well, again, I would remind Planning Commission that you're looking at 125406 standards when you're reviewing this application and making your recommendation. And eventually what you're gonna have to decide after you look at the review standards is whether you're forwarding our recommendation to council to approve disapprove or approve with modifications. So after the public hearing would be the time to make any motion as far as modifications. If you do suggest modifications as a commission, they should be grounded in the code. So you would probably want to point to where in chapter 1254 you're getting the language if you make any motions for modifications. Hey, hey Judy. Somebody's trying, so Frank needs to be unmuted. He, he ain't got co-share no more. All right, I think we lost Frank for a bit and now he's back. So, uh, Frank, you should be able to unmute yourself now. 
Yes, I can now. Okay. Yeah, I got bumped out of the meeting uh, inexplicably a few minutes ago and joined back in, but uh, but was permanently muted. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So thank you, Laura, for your questions, and thank you, Bri Brianne, for the uh, clarification. And we'll talk more about that when we come to the actual voting process. Uh, do other members of the Planning Commission have any questions? for Greg at this point. I know I have a couple. Uh, I'll just go ahead. Uh, Greg, where are you on my screen? Oh, there you are. Uh, I was just wondering if you could give me, uh, if you happen to know the numbers of, of how many units there'll be in this development with the, uh, under the PUD versus if it went through the regular zoning. How many more units did you gain with PUD? Uh, I understand the question, Frank. Let me try to give me the best answer I can get here. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to pull up my plan here. Yeah, if somebody sees me staring at the screen, it's because I'm trying to count. Um, I do believe we have 70 some single family units in this particular plan. Um, there was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, four unit buildings. So, you know, roughly 28, uh, townhomes and then, um, give or take. Are we talking about what you have, what you're proposing now? Yes. Because you have yeah, six, I, I was... 64 single family. 22 um, three bedroom, th th 33 bedroom, 22 two bedroom, and seven buildings with 24 units for a total of 140. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you had that broken down in front of you because I don't, <laughs> I was trying to count. Yeah, but I don't know if that was his question or not. Uh, yeah, no, uh, his question was. Then the second part of the question was how many single family homes could I get if that's all we were doing? Right. And the answer to that question, I think, is largely where you see a duplex here, there would be a single family home. So if we had 60 and then we have some 40 duplexes units, we'd probably have about 20 more uh, single family homes in those areas. And then another seven or eight um, in where you're showing the town homes. So we'd probably have close to 85 to 90 um, single family homes kind of depends on how we laid it out and how many homes we put in the affordable right. housing area, which is being donated to the village. We'd also, you know, probably use a little bit more of the uh, green space if we had straight zoning. So, you know, one of the uh, benefits of the PUD is the is the open space dedication. So, if, if we were going straight zoning, the cul-de-sacs that currently have the uh, the duplexes would get a little longer into an extractive wetland would likely be smaller or go away. And uh, we'd, we'd build into that area a little further, just give us room for a few more homes. And then um, of course we could, like I said, build on the area for the, um, for the uh, affordable housing and then we could build on the park area too. So if we try to maximize out the site for just single family and really did our, our, uh, you know, our, lay our tightest layout, we probably get close to 100 single family homes here if we really looked at it. Uh, George just said 100. We have, did have a plan for 117 at one time. Okay. And then another question I have is and this has to do with your, if you want to grab it, your exhibit K, the Homeowners Association. And specifically, uh, you know, I, I just have some concerns about some of the items that are currently listed in the homeowners association agreement that, uh, I'm, uh, for example, I'm on page two in, in, under covenants and restrictions, use and occupancy, um, you know, uh, boarding or raising of livestock or poultry will not be permitted. Uh, and boy, you know, I don't know if it, uh, how it is around you, but you know, a lot of people in Yellow Springs own chickens. Uh, and I presume that, you know, even, even in a new development, 
you know, if we're if we're looking at uh, you know Yellow Springs, that we want the new development to be sort of in keeping with the spirit of, of of Yellow Springs, and certainly one of the spirits of Yellow Springs over the last ten years or so has been the, the keeping of poultry. Uh, similarly, I know we just got done with it a few months ago on Planning Commission, uh, you know, uh, changing the uh, standards for. Well, you know, yeah, because uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, um, um, I think you require turf lawns in, in the way the home in, homeowner agreement is currently written. And I know we've updated the, uh, you know, the, uh, the standards in Yellow Springs to allow for uh, natural landscaping. And, you know, surely somewhere along the line, somebody is going to want to do uh, perhaps natural landscaping. Uh, there's also you know, sheds will be permitted one per lot, not to exceed 120 square feet and painted to match the primary structure. And if you've driven around Yellow Springs, I think, you know, Yellow Springs people want to paint their primary, you know, their structures, however they want to paint them, regardless of, of what the primary structure is. So I, I, I'm concerned with a number of aspects in the Homeowners Association, the way it's, uh, uh, the way it's currently written that aren't really in keeping with, uh, the rest of the village, if that makes sense. Uh, and if that'd be something that you'd be open to modifying some of those details uh, along, the, along the way. The answer is yes. So we've had a lot of discussions about our HLA regs. And one of the reasons why you got the outline you did, as opposed to just a copy of our standard HLA regulations was, you know, we, we recognize that uh, this is a unique community and it's gonna need some unique regulations. Um, so how exactly that goes forward, I think we're open to discussions. I'm not you know, necessarily willing to, to here tonight give up on allowing, uh, raising a poultry, but um, I'm willing to discuss. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we, the, the HOAs will exist, whether it's a PUD or, or a straight single family development. So under both, both proposals, it'll have to have an HOA to accomplish a couple of things. Most notably, some organization will need to own the uh, stormwater improvements yeah. and, and pay for its maintenance. So uh, if, if nothing else, the HOA has to do that. The right. other rules and restrictions are, are deed restrictions that get put on the property by the developer and, and enforced through our management organization as time goes on. What exactly those are and how those work, I think is a little bit flexible, um, but we want to do enough to, uh, to give our homeowners, our buyers, some confidence you know, in the investment they're making, um, you know, and, and, and enough flexibility to kind of be in keeping Yellow Springs. I, I agree that's probably not a well-defined point, um, and it might take us a while to define it. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we provided the summary as opposed to yeah. details. And I think rather than, than agree or disagree on any particular points on this particular thing tonight, I, I would rather just commit to work with staff on those and, okay. uh, and kind of pound them out as time goes on. Because you know, honestly, the entire set is a very long set of, of things. And, uh, and poultry is one of those things in particular. You know, the difference between two chickens and 10 chickens it is significant and uh, some people will uh, not mind a rooster and others think roosters make lots of noises um they so do <laughs> to talk about it okay yeah. but yeah i yeah and i didn't expect to you know hammer out details tonight but i just wanted you know when i read through that those were little little weird yellow springs alarm bells that were going off in my head uh looking out my front yard and realizing that you know, my front yard would 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 never be acceptable in your in in, in your neighborhood. So, <laughs> and uh, uh, the intended to be an insult to anybody by putting those out there. It was more of just an intention to say, hey, look, these are kind of the right. summary of things we typically would require, um, yeah. and, and kind of go from there. Frank, if I might, this is George. If I might add, um, when dealing with a homeowners association like this, especially when you're dealing with three or four different types of products. A lot of the uh, townhouses and or the flex units, those are all typically going to be sold to individuals on a per unit basis. 
you could have an investor come in and own an entire duplex or an entire townhouse building, but the chances are more likely that those are gonna be sold to individuals. Um, and there's, um, there's a homeowners association that's gonna be in place that has to take care of the detention basins and, and other facilities anyway. And a lot of times we can bring an economy of scale to a homeowner when they're coming in to mow the grass for 140 people as opposed to one. And, and uh, so those are some of the things that we'll talk about with STEM and, and perhaps another workshop session later on to kind of sort out what makes sense for this community. Okay. Okay, and then the other area of question that I have, I, I believe you said that you uh, have somebody for representing the uh, choice one for the traffic study? We do. Okay, because uh, I was wondering, because uh, we certainly in, in the communications, uh, and I know we uh, during our uh, work session that we had a number of weeks ago, we talked about it, but certainly in a lot of the letters that uh, Planning Commission has received regarding uh, this development for this hearing, lots of concerns have been raised about uh, about traffic flow and traffic studies. So I was hoping that maybe the engineer could come on and talk uh, sort of uh, briefly and clearly and concisely about how the traffic study was conducted and what the conclusions of the traffic study uh, study were. Would that be possible? I think so. Mike, are you available? Uh, Frank, you see if Jeff uh, put off or Mike Guttermaker's still on? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Okay, okay. Frank, Frank, can I briefly swear him in as a witness? Sure. Okay. Um, sir, can you state your name and employment very briefly for the record? Uh, Michael Gottemuller, and I work with Choice One Engineering. Okay. And how long have you been in that position? Uh, almost eight years. Okay. What's your educational background, sir, as far as engineering goes? I uh, graduated from the University of Dayton in 2013 with um, a civil engineering degree. Okay. You understand that your testimony today is in the context of an adjudicator an adjudicatory hearing before the planning commission because they're going to be making a recommendation to the village council? Yes. Okay. And what is your testimony going to concern for the traffic study? Um, just a summary of, uh, of what our results were. Okay. And yeah. could you also... Yeah, I, do I, I asked you know, to you know, speak about how it was conducted and what the results were. Yeah. Okay. And could you uh, also just briefly elaborate on what your... Um, what your methodology methodology is when you conduct those studies um, when Frank begins his questioning. That's all I have, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Michael. So, yeah, go, um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, all right. So we, we when we conducted our traffic impact study, um, we went out and we took some traffic counts at the intersection of Hyde Road and Spillan Road. Um, and with those traffic counts, um, we were, you know, we were able to do some observations in the field. What, what does existing traffic look like? Existing, what do speeds look like? What do the traffic volumes look like? How many people are turning? Um, do some field observations. And from the field, field observations, we come back in the office, process all the traffic data, um, and we begin our analysis based on the number of homes in the field. So um, we have a total number of homes. We utilize information from ODOT, the Ohio Department of Transportation, and nationally accepted standards um, to come up with an, a number of trips that the proposed development is going to generate. So um, we and, come and up those, with... And, and yeah. those numbers are pretty standard across the country when these surveys are done, aren't there? These traffic studies are done, aren't they? That's correct, Frank. Um, the Institute yeah. of uh, Transportation Engineers, the ITE, mm -hmm. Um, they have standard, they've come up with trip generation numbers um, okay. to help us come up with that. And there's, that's what every, every traffic impact study we do, almost every traffic study that we do, it utilizes those numbers. So we, we found for this development, we found the, what kind of trips this facility would generate. Um, and from there, we do um, some traffic forecast. So we know the existing traffic volumes. We know approximately the number of trips that 
the facility is going to generate, and we distribute those additional trips onto the roadways. Um, and from, from there, now we have some projected traffic volumes of what it's gonna be when the development is constructed. And we do uh, several different analysis. We do some capacity analysis, and that tells us uh, the delay or the level of service. You know, how, how much time is each driver gonna, you know, how much delay are they gonna experience when they pull up to a stop sign and continue on their way to work or on their way to the grocery store? Um, so we come up, that's the capacity analysis. And then we also do a turn lane warrant analysis. So we'll look at, um, at the intersections that we studied, which in this case, we, we studied the intersection of Spallan and the proposed drive and um, the nationally accepted or what almost every community, what we do is we, we go one drive beyond that. So in this case, we went one drive south, Spallan and Hyde Road, and then Spallan and Edgefield Drive. So those were then, um, I guess, and then uh, Southgate and Edgefield um, were, was our study limits. So we looked at those four intersections and we did our capacity analysis and the turn lane warrant analysis um, and we did a site distance analysis at the intersection of Spallan and the proposed drive. And in summary of what we found is on the capacity analysis side, there's very, very little additional delay that drivers are going to see. Um, out here where we have um, a level of service A or less than 10 seconds of delay for every approach um, in an, in an setting like this, generally what ODOT accepts is up to a level of service D. So we are much, much better than what the, those thresholds are. And then we did the, the turn lane warrant analysis. And based on the turn lane warrant analysis, there were no additional turn lanes. So like a left turn lane or a right turn lane, there were no turn lanes warranted. Um, those are charts that we follow based on the traffic volumes. Um, and that's uh, standard from the Ohio Department of Transportation. So there were no turn lanes warranted. And then finally, we did our, our site distance analysis. And we did that at the intersection of Spallan and the proposed drive. And what we found was that there was sufficient site distance um, looking left and looking right as you exit the development um, to merge onto Spallan Road. Frank, does that answer yeah. most of your questions? Yeah, I think so. Do any other members of the Planning Commission have any I, questions? Yeah. I, have a, I have a question about this. So on this proposed drive going out into Spallan, so if you turn right, you get to Hyde Road. Uh, a lot of the folks who are concerned about the traffic are folks who live on Spillan, but they're, they would be, if you had gone out of that drive and turned left, do you have a, a did you use a number for how many more people are going to be driving down Spillan who are going to come out of the development, and turn left, or are going to be driving down Spillan and then turning into the development? Um, yeah. So what we anticipated was approximately 65% of the vehicles will be turning right out of the development um, with the remaining vehicles turning left. Okay. And so how many extra cars on Spillan does that work out to be? Um, I'm, I'm sure I could have looked that. it up in the thing, but I didn't, I didn't realize I was going to ask the question. <laughs> yeah. Just one second. So in the typical peak hour on Spillan, So what we're looking at in a typical morning peak hour would be approximately out of that proposed drive, we would have um, 50, 56 people turning right and approximately nine turning left out of the drive is what that works out to be during the AM peak hour. Okay. And then in the PM peak hour, turning vehicles out of the development would be 36 turning right and six turning left. Okay. And then basically corresponding this, those people they're going to leave and they're also going to come back. So in that peak and, hour, I mean, I don't know when they're going to come back, but 
you're talking about those kinds of numbers of people each way. Uh, yeah, similarly, in the a.m. peak hour, there'll be more people leaving than are coming in. So in the morning, you know, we're talking in the 60s leaving um, and then probably less than 10 that are coming back into the development on average. Okay. And then in the evening, we have um, in the 40s, in the low 40s that are going to be leaving during the typical peak hour and um, in the neighborhood of uh, in the 20s coming back into the development during the peak hour. Okay. All right. Thank you. And by peak hour, just you know, so everybody's clear, and you tend to use peak hour numbers, so that's kind of a, like a worst case scenario. Is that that's, that's as heavy as it's going to be? Correct, Frank. That what we typically look at are the you know the what is typically the highest a.m. peak hour. You know when people are going to work, coming home from or going to work, and then in the evenings when they're coming home from work. Um, those are the two hours that we look at in worst case, and. And what we find in most situations is is usually the PM peak hour in a traditional residential setting is is the higher. Okay. Okay. Uh, any any members of planning? Yeah, Laura. I have a couple of questions back to the width of the streets and what's going to be permitted. So on the extension of Southgate, and I presume the street that connects to Spillan. These are the two bigger streets. Is that correct? 31, um, the street, 30, the street 31, that goes all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. L Laura, they called that Street A is the piece that street goes a? off of, of okay. Spillan. Southgate yeah. and Street A. Are th those are 31 feet in length, the pavement. Is that correct? Width. Uh, yeah, width. In width. So, as I understand it, a fire truck needs 20 feet of unobstructed uh, right of way. So, will they'll there could be parking on both sides of those two streets? Is that right? That's where you're directing your. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mike, do you want to answer these questions? Or want me to answer them? I think we lost Mike. Um, Mike's muted. <laughs> muted again. Sorry, Zoom uh, difficulties. But uh, to answer Laura's question, yes, we do anticipate uh, parking be allowed on both sides of both streets. With um, again, the the uh, narrower streets are wider or as wide anyway as what would be um, per Green County's subdivision uh, codes. So, you know, the, the uh, village subdivision codes don't really regulate a street width. So we went with Green County's regulation for the smallest streets and, and the somewhat wider street that cuts through the community. Again, we, we followed the existing uh, spill land uh, profile in that uh, we felt it made sense to, uh, to continue the existing design, um, and that's why, I'm sorry, Southgate profile, Southgate. <laughs> design of Southgate through that area. Um, you know, certainly I'm willing to work with Johnny and discuss those if there's some tweaking that the village feels necessary on either one of those. But uh, we were making proposals based on some of the concerns we'd heard, and uh, these are some of the uh, the things we can offer. Um, you know, look to uh, slow down traffic through there. I, I do understand the bicycling uh, discussion. We've had a lot of those talks uh, with uh, the staff, and then. You're happy to, to continue them, um, but uh, that well, my, qu my question is different. Let me go at it another way. The smaller streets, the cul-de-sac streets. So one standard I saw online that if a, a street is less than 28 feet in width, you're not you're not going to be allowed to have parking on the street and still have fire fire access. So it seems like on the cul-de-sac streets there will be no on-street parking. Is that is that correct? Oh, that's not the way Green County enforces it in their code. They, they allow okay. free parking and still have the fire access. Now, like I said, we're willing to work with the fire department if they got a different different understanding of that. But uh, elsewhere in Green County, um, parking is allowed on the streets for a street that way. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, and Thanks. Laura, I would point out that um, our subdivision regs in 1226 make specific reference to the construction of the street standards according to Greene County specifications. So that's part of where they're getting it from. Okay. Um, if, if, if I can just throw in, because I yeah. got really curious and I, and I, I, I just looked on at Google and according to Google, which isn't the ultimate authority, um, it says, and I don't know what this comes from, National Fire or something or other uh, organization, a minimum 20 foot width allows for two way vehicular traffic and for one fire apparatus. So, so, um, you know, so it needs a little bit of research, but it sounds like the, what they're proposing would be okay based on national standards. All right, uh, do any members of the Planning Commission have any further questions for uh, uh, Greg at this point? I think Michael, you can go ahead and mute yourself again. I think, are we done with uh, Michael and traffic for now? I, okay. I would just note that if Planning Commission so inclined, they could consider his testimony as an expert witness based on his answers to the Daubert questioning. Okay, so do members of the Planning Commission, anybody, any remaining questions right now for uh, Greg? Because uh, I'm getting ready to open up the public hearing otherwise. Frank, before you open yes. the public hearing, okay. I, we just make a determination that I will make note of questions. All responses to questions be held until the public hearing is closed again, if you're okay. agreeable with that. And then if you could let me know how many minutes we're giving people. Okay. Uh, I think we're uh, what we'd like to do is, because I presume there's a lot of people here who would like to uh, speak to this. And so we're probably uh, going to uh, try to limit your comments to two minutes. Uh, Judy will be keeping time on, uh, on your, your comments. And when you reach the two minutes, she'll chime in and say uh, time is up. And I'll give you time to uh, finish your sentence, but then we'll have to move on to the next person who, who wants to speak. Um, uh, and yeah, so you're gonna keep track of the questions that are raised, Judy, is that what you were saying? And then be able to, instead of, instead of this public hearing trying to, you know, turning into a, a back and forth, we'll just collect the questions and we'll get them addressed at the end uh, after everybody's had a chance to ask their questions or raise their concerns. So once again, uh, please be patient in the Zoom format and uh, uh, raise your hands electronically or if that doesn't work for you, somehow try to wave around and catch people's attention and we will get you logged in. And I have about 80 people on my screen right now. So I'm hoping I'll be able to uh, read everybody's names. But uh, why don't we start with uh, uh, Kevin, or the first person I see, upper left-hand corner, Kevin Stokes. Kevin, um, I would remind you about our conversation last week. <laughs> okay, uh, Kevin, can you get unmuted? There we go. Oh, you're muted again now. Can Kevin unmute himself or does he have to be unmuted? There we go. Okay. Okay. Hi, Kevin Stokes. Hi. Um, I'm a resident in the neighborhood. So regarding traffic, I know that there were, um, Michael, I think is the gentleman that was speaking, saying that traffic coming out of the proposed road, um, you know, most folks will go right and fewer folks will go left. Um, I'm sure that's based on something. So I won't go into that, but let's say it's based on some fact. But so much traffic going right, then onto high road, which will take you up to the light or stop, the, uh, the stop signs, flashing stop lines at Hyde and US 68. Has that 
intersection been considered in terms of the impact? I know it's outside of whatever parameters you set for your study, you know, but we are contributing to, you know, another major intersection that's uh, not the most pleasant intersection to go through in the first place, uh, as it is, because of various factors. So have, has the impact to that intersection been um, considered? And to what degree would anyone on this call be responsible for doing something about it? I think that's all I have. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'm just gonna keep going in a line here. Uh, Max Chrome. We get Max unmuted. Max, are you there? <clears throat> oh, there we go. You there, Max? Okay. Hi there. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Hi. Um, I'll try to go quick. I have a lot of concerns about. Um, and we do. Uh, and we do have your letter as part of the record as well. So thank you. Thank you. So I'd encourage everyone to get access to my letter. It's a very detailed analysis of the application. Um, anyone who has questions about this, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Um, I wanted to really take a high level look at, at at what this is. The developer is asking for a planned unit development, a PUD. Uh, so, you know, and they've they've offered the village these amenities in exchange for it. Um, so, you know, what what is the real what's the deal that's happening here? What's the exchange of sort of what, what you know, what's the negotiation involved? And I want to try to break it down, make it really clear. The for a developer to get a planned unit development, it is worth millions of dollars to them. Um, it, it, it what it means is that they get one approval for a hundred and however many uh, homes, and then they can just go and build them. There won't be an opportunity to come back and revisit them home by home. And so as they're built over five years, like this is your one chance to look at this. Um, and so that's what they're getting out of it. They're getting, they're saving the hassle of having to apply for each application. They're saving the hassle of having to evaluate each site individually. And they're just kind of doing this thing and it's like, here you know, we've spent a couple hours on this thing and then they're gonna be running with it for, for the next several years. Um, so that's what they're getting out of it. They kind of get to move on. Uh, and what, what we're getting out of it, we're getting some increased density. Uh, we're getting an acre. Uh, for a park, we're getting a you know couple acres for affordable housing, but I want to put it to everybody that's way too cheap to sell what we're giving. Um, there's the, the what what we're giving up is the ability to control the feel and the look of the development. Uh, there's a hundred and uh, the sixteen hundred households in Yellow Springs. They're proposing this is about eight percent of the household. So what we're talking about tonight would increase the number of households by 8%. That's huge. This, this, this village is- And that is two minutes. Uh, if anyone wants to yield their time, they've got more to go. I think I have two minutes because um, uh, I, I wasn't oh. unmuted for the whole two minutes. I'd like to get another couple minutes. Well, just, Bob, well, I can't afford you another couple of minutes, maybe another minute real quick. Okay, so the, 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 there's many items, that it's the planning commissioners, it's up to you to guard the culture of, of this village. Um, if we let this development just run from today and it goes to the, uh, the, the council and it's approved, it will run unchecked for the next five or six years. If we don't approve, let the developer develop. There's no need to densify it. This area is transitioning from, from single family residents to rural. Allow it to stay what it is. There's, this is the wrong place to densify. Take a care fit that you must, you must find that this application conforms with it in order to approve this PUD. It, it has some very specific requirements around mm -hmm. uh, what, what's gonna be provided. And, I, and the, the application simply does not meet the standard. You, 
I'm asking you to require a peer-reviewed traffic report. I'm asking you to require a phase one environmental wrap study. Wrap it up, Max. Do not <laughs> let that, do yeah. not let this application just zip on through. Hold them right. to the Thank highest you. possible standard. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, and next, I see uh, Chad Stiles. All right. We get uh, Chad unmuted. Chad is still muted. Am I on? Uh, I heard you there for a second. Okay. Can anyone hear me? I can hear you. Can other people? Do not if you can hear them. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry for that. Um, thanks for giving me a minute, and I'd be happy to give um, – I only need a minute, so I'd be happy to give Mr. Crone my extra time. Um, I live about a half mile away from the plan development, uh, south end of Quarry Street. Um, my wife and I have several concerns. Um, in terms of the traffic, um, Kevin, Kevin Stokes talked about the intersection with 68 and Hyde Road. Well, actually, Hyde Road eventually leads to 675. It's the way many of us get out to you know, work and, and life uh, beyond Yellow Springs. And so that um, having additional, you know, potentially 200 some more homes and all those people going out that would have quite a big impact, I think, on traffic. Um, Hyde Road's just a blinking light, so that's kind of known. I've, I've lived in town for many years, and we've kind of known that's always been um, a place where there are accidents. So I'm concerned about that. The other concern I have, or, or really the, the larger concern, is just how this will transform this whole neighborhood, um, which is a rural um, neighborhood that's bordered by farmland and green space, the green belt. Um, you know, I, I was there, I, I remember to come to land trust and, uh, protecting the Whitehall farm. And I'm just surprised that we're not taking a little more pause, um, a little more effort to protect this, um, farmland and open space. So like I say, uh, that's all I have. Um, anyone else could have my, my time if they need it. Thank you. Thank and you, Chad. Frank, we don't yeah, do no, time sharing. No, we don't, yeah, we can't do time sharing. That's just way too complicated, unfortunately. But uh, so we're going to go on now to uh, Lindsay. Um, I would like to go ahead and yield my time to Max. Uh, he has more well, to say. Yeah. And well, we're just yeah, that's very complicated, particularly in a Zoom format. So. So if you have a comment to make, uh, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I think that this uh, development will be a huge driver for gentrification, uh, which is already an issue. This doesn't take uh, our village resources that are already thin, our infrastructure, our schools, um, traffic patterns, um, things like that into consideration. Uh, this is not a good fit. It is not in keeping with the character of uh, Yellow Springs. This is Beaver Creek. We have had uh, numerous villagers voice uh, opposition to things that make us look like Beaver Creek or make us conform to policies like Beaver Creek. Um, this is not a good fit for Yellow Springs and uh, I think we can do better and I think we should do better. And I implore the planning commission uh, to put this, uh, to put more thought in this and not, uh, not approve this tonight. Uh, put more thought in it, get more input. Um, it deserves more thought than this. It's it's very important. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, next I have is uh, Patrick Lake, is that right? Patrick, you there? Oh, good, yep, I am, good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to, um, uh, echo the concerns that Max and Lindsay brought up. Uh, I'd like to challenge the traffic study. Uh, I don't believe that it took enough factors into consideration. There was no consideration of the pedestrian and bicycle traffic on Spillan, uh, which is significant through the day. 
Um, and I believe that uh, the village is going to have to consider expansion of Spillan, and I don't believe the neighbors, uh, property owners on Spillan, uh, would be excited about the prospects of losing property and trees and landscaping. Uh, <clears throat> I also like to say, I think the uh, homeowners association fit in Yellow Springs is really poor. I lived in Beaver Creek for 10 years, uh, grew up in Yellow Springs. One of the reasons I came back to this community was because of the unique nature of and feel uh, and independence of being able to do what you want, how you feel on your property, unlike in other communities. Uh, and so I'd like to uh, yield any additional time. I know that's complicated, Frank, but uh, you've got a couple of minutes that you could give to Max. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how many other people comment, and we'll see what time we have. So, but thank you. Okay. Uh, looks like uh, is it uh, Dino? Will you let me in? Yes, are you there? All right, Dino Palata, Miami Township resident, Yellow Springs resident. Hey, a couple of issues I wanna go over everything with. Um, safety on Spillan's obviously a big issue that's gonna keep coming up, but I'm gonna challenge, I guess, with, with the traffic report, going north on Spillan. It's a narrow road, no sidewalks, uh, biking, there's no bike lanes. That still has to be, a, to, to say that you're gonna put 140 homes in there, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna say, let's be conservative. You're gonna have 225 cars going out every day. That means they're go, they're not gonna all be going right and going to Hyde Road. They're gonna be coming up Spillan. So you're gonna increase traffic no matter what. And in doing so, you're gonna impact negatively that neighborhood, an existing neighborhood with a new development. And I hope that Planning Commission, along with Ober, has taken a look at this. We like to have a, a negative impact report on what this traffic is going to do to that existing neighborhood. And I think that's something that's important that's gotta be taken into account is what that impact is gonna be. And it's gonna be a negative impact and we'd like to see what that negative impact report will come back as. For the record, I wanna hear again that we said that there is going to be no cost to the taxpayers with infrastructure, or the cost of the roads, cost of the sewer lines, uh, cost of electric. I want to I want to hear that from the record from Denise or from anybody that's official uh, on on the village to say that we're not going to be having to subsidize this through taxes. Lastly, uh, I want to look at the green technology, uh, just green technology in building the in building these units. Um, it's exclusive. I mean, we have a unique way of doing things in Yellow Springs, and I want to make sure that we're looking at this that green technology is being used on these new homes. And if it's not being looked at, we need to know why it's not being looked at. We really want to look at it because we're a green community and we want to push forward with that. I look forward to your responses. And again, I'm going to say the same thing that Patrick said and everyone else, when I else said, don't rush into this, get the answers. We need the answers to know what, what we're getting into before we push forward with this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dino. Uh, Alex Melamed. I think you're unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I want to alter, uh, offer a little bit of an alternative. I'm a local designer, so thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I have some uh, ideas that I hope the village and Ober can hear. First, I want to say appreciate the work that uh, the village staff and Ober have done uh, to meet the needs uh, of affordability here. Um, as someone who has participated in land development, I know how hard that is. Um, and so I have a perspective on that. And I don't wanna poo poo anything, but I do wanna to bring to your attention um, three topics I'm calling bad news, good news, and really good news. Bad news. First, quick fixes um, on an out of date approach to land development do not make a good plan or a great neighborhood. And we need great neighborhoods. A park with plastic play furniture, donated poor people's corner, a cut through a detention basin that's called a wetland do not equate to access to open land, whole and diverse community, encouragement to active transportation or responsible up-to-date stormwater management and stewardship of natural hydrology. The whole idea of taking a large parcel and dividing it up evenly so everybody gets a wide drive and a patch of sod 
doesn't make the best and highest use of land nor affordable um, uh, for an affordable present or future, <clears throat> nor a flourishing community or natural environment. The good news is there is a great um, area. This is a great area to build homes. Yellow Springs really needs over to build homes here. Um, there are a few well-vetted planning concepts that can be implemented that will provide just, a just <clears throat> as many homes, but also up to half of the land being conserved. This set aside land serves as the uh, fantastic playground, actor transportation pathway, and stormwater management. Yellow Springs just released a great stormwater management guideline that uh, has perfect designs laid out to mitigate stormwater with swales and vegetated buffers rather than uh, goose ditches. Um, a wide vegetated buffer is a beautiful view for homes, um, from homes, and is a great place for the active transportation pathway. So the really good news is uh, this can be a win, win, win scenario. We can have- it Alex, it's two minutes. Can I have uh, one, 30 seconds? 30 seconds more, yeah. Uh, you can implement conservation style land development and provide Yellow Springs with a much needed homes that are affordable, low maintenance, and adjacent to a fantastic open, as open land asset. For, uh, good for residents, you can do this to conserve natural resources, that's good for the world. And you can do this to reduce infrastructure investment by up to a third, speed up development, and raise property values, values by tens of thousands of dollars per lot, um, which is great for Oberer. So that's a win-win-win. I urge you guys all to consider more options, um, even in the, uh, in the sense of just hearing it out and do more options rather than this, something a little more 21st century, please. OK, appreciate your uh, giving me the extra time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eve Fleck. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, are you there? I just wanted to make a point that uh, Yellow Springs has put a lot of energy and effort into being designated as a community wildlife habitat. And basically what this means is that the community wildlife habitats of which my property is designated, garden and landscape with wildlife in mind, promote the use of native trees and plants, work to reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides and chemicals, and integrate wildlife-friendly practices into sustainability park and master plans. I um, am finding this kind of at odds with the notion of a homeowners association, and I wonder what steps will be taken to allow individual homeowners to have pollinator-friendly yards, community wildlife habitats, to eliminate turf, and to have healthier ecosystems on their properties? And I would yield my time to that. Okay. Thank you very much, Eve. Uh, Issa. Is that okay? That was perfect. That was yes, very... that's very good. Okay. Yeah. Great. I can speak. You need to get, you need to get muted again, Eve. We can still hear you. I think the Wildlife Association is. Hello? Uh, Eve, can you mute, mute yourself, please? Oh, sorry. Okay, Issa, it... go ahead. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, um, I also would like to um, let Max talk more because I know he's he's uh, very well studied in this, but I'd like to say a few things. Um, just regarding the culture here, I feel like this would only gentrify uh, Yellow Springs, as Lindsay stated. Um, and I like to just encourage uh, um, everybody just to think about what what values uh, what values we like to uphold here in Yellow Springs. What what makes us who we are, and let's just not forget this, you know, because if we do this, it'll it's going to look more and more like Beaver Creek. It's going to look more and more like surrounding areas. And um, it'll take away from us. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Emily Seibel. There you go. Thank you. I'm Emily Seibel. I'm the executive director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. And to the members of Planning Commission, I just wanted to say that uh, while the Ober proposed development meets the market demand outlined in the housing needs assessment for higher income housing, 
the result will be a less balanced market with persistent affordable housing needs for many residents. Um, the goal of higher income for sale housing is met with this project. And so we urge a renewed focus on advancing lasting affordable housing through this project and beyond. Um, while the project generates much needed revenue for the village and schools, um, it will also have an impact on our market for years to come as relatively expensive homes enter the market as comparables. Um, I am very curious how the proposed price points by housing type compare to the comparables now on the market and what impact the developers anticipate um, to overall property values in Yellow Springs and taxes in Yellow Springs. Um, for example, comparing the duplex model to the current sale prices and property values at Park Meadows, um, just as one example. So um, overall, we're ready to support lasting affordable housing however we can. Uh, the dire need for affordable housing in our community is escalating, especially for persons of low to moderate income, making less than 80% of area median income, which uh, represents 40% of the population. Um, we appreciate your Please. commitment to an affordability component, and we encourage you to bring an affordability lens to all of your discussions and deliberations uh, because the crisis is growing. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Brooke. Hi there. Um, I'm at the site of Edgefield Drive, um, the one that where the road will be going towards to the new community. And I have an issue with the traffic that is going to be flowing through the the whole neighborhood. I feel like it needs to be reevaluated. Um, I feel like that is going to be much more than what has been observed. And I feel like there's going to be much more than what they are going to actually have. Um, also, we are concerned um, as homeowners in regards to what this is going to affect our property. Um, if you notice, the diversity is going to be like the low income housing in the front towards our property, and there's going to be more like other houses, wealthier houses in the front. Um, then we need to go and actually make it a diverse community and actually like like go in diverse those communities with that so so thank you <laughs> sorry i'm about it like that the 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 traffic and everything is it's going to be a big thing like it, it really is and like the Reimbursed for the property. Yeah, and, and the, the way that the road is designed is going directly through our properties. So we are very concerned about that right now. Uh, Brooke, can you give your last name, please? It's Obringer. Thank and you. that's, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Brooke. Uh, Matthew. Yeah. Are you there, Matthew? I am. I'm trying to get unmuted. Can uh, you see me? Yes. You can hear me too. Yep. Wonderful. Great. You know, it wouldn't be a planning commission meeting if I didn't comment. So, um, hey, I guess the one thing that I kind of have been gleaning from some of this conversation is it feels like a lot of people don't necessarily think that the developer maybe fully understands the community. And so I'm curious to know uh, what kind of research the developer did about Yellow Springs uh, when they were coming up with this uh, plan and choosing uh, the housing types that were going to be offered. Because I think, to be honest, a lot of people look at a development like this and say, this does not match what in my head I think of when I think of Yellow Springs. It reminds me of, you know, a, your standard, more modern suburban development. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to hear just kind of what research they did to familiarize themselves with the community, uh, its history and its values, 
you know, the one thing my wife always said to me that she loved about Yellow Springs growing up here was that you could have a millionaire living next to somebody on public assistance. And uh, I think that's kind of like great kind of like uh, guide as far as like what we should be shooting for with these kind of things. Thank you. Appreciate it, Frank. Thank you. Uh, is it Anna Burke? Unmute. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, so my internet gets a little spotty, so if I cut out at any time, please stop me and let me know okay. so I don't ramble on. So I'm, I'm late to the meeting, but everything I've heard right now um, has resonated. And I just wanted to pop in to talk about something real quick that maybe some people haven't thought of. If you guys don't know me, I'm a 10-year resident of Yellow Springs, and I live in the Vale, um, the intentional community off of Hyde Road. Um, and just kind of like Brooke, I mean, those neighbors there are going to get so crushed by the traffic and all those. But the point that I want to bring up is um, the impact on wildlife. That's been at the forefront of my mind this entire time as someone who just like everyone else who lives here enjoys the wildlife that we get to enjoy that most people don't. Um, it's my strong opinion that this development will completely wipe out any remaining like wildlife safety sanctuary space that has been provided so far. Um, everyone on this end of, end of town gets to enjoy deer, um, you know, the horses are at peace, things that you usually wouldn't see in town. And a lot of people, you'll probably see this at night, you see the deer come this way towards the Vale, towards, you know, the riding center and everything. And that whole span of area every evening. And if you increase the traffic and put this massive development in, that's over. So I just want to bring that point to the forefront of everyone's mind that, you know, traffic is a huge deal, all the other elements that were brought up, but Wildlife is a huge factor, and it's something that, in my opinion, will literally disappear if this development goes through. Um, I was recently made aware that there hasn't been an environmental impact assessment done on this project and how it will affect that. So that's, that's just what's crushing for me in terms of this development. Um, and yeah, that, that's about it. Please consider the wildlife impact that this would have. Good. Thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I'm not seeing anybody with else with a raised hand. Well, no, I just said uh, Tony. I'm not sure if Tony's last name, but Tony's iPad just popped up. Tony, are you there? Can we get Tony up? I keep on muting it repeatedly. Frank, can you hear me? This is Tony Laracuta. Oh, yeah, we can hear you now, Tony. Okay, thank you. You know, my question is, why haven't, why haven't we pushed farther to, to push the developer to access directly onto Route 68? This is a major development. Why not, rather than dump out on Hyde Road, which is a dangerous intersection, or here into the neighborhood where it's not appropriate, why doesn't the developer go straight out onto 68 the way they should? I know I've heard that they don't own any property. Well, I think they need to work a lot harder on making that happen. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Tony. Frank, can I add to that? This is Dave Stratton, since I'm sitting yeah, next yeah. to her. I haven't heard uh, much conversation about how over plans to tie into the sewer, the sanitary or the storm. Um, curious that right now we already have some issue in our, in our area, south of the land with uh, flooding during the heavy rain and uh, sanitary issues of clogging drains. Now we're gonna load our sewers, um, both sanitary and storm with additional residents. So uh, since I didn't hear them, but brush over that subject, it seems like that needs more understanding. Okay. And then secondly, we're dumping out onto a, currently a township road, which I only heard over was taking responsibility for half of it. Um, 
you come north on Spillane to a blind curve to a stop sign and a hill. Um, that looks uh, tragic to us. And if you're talking about dumping south on the Hyde, again, you're dumping onto a township road. No berms, uh, no line, no, no, uh, no other access for horses, pedestrians, or otherwise. And since you've got homes that are directly on the land now with the development, they're going to be backing out and going north and south. Uh, I heard the, the traffic uh, engineer talk about 35% of the traffic will go north, but then he only said out of 60 cars, nine would go north. I don't think that's 35%. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Uh, I don't see anybody else other than Max. Oh, I see, oh, wait a minute, down here is uh, Noah? Thank you. No, Adams, okay. It is not electronically raising a hand, uh, it's just waving. <clears throat> Are you there, Noah? On mute. Nope, we can hear you. That was me, Den Denise. Oh, that was Denise. Can we get Noah unmuted? There she goes. There we go. There we Hi, go. This, is, this is Nina Ellis, along with Noah. I'm on Noah's oh, computer. Okay. Um, Noah's here with me as well. We live on the south side of town. Um, and we would also like to echo many of the concerns that have already been raised about traffic. Um, I also have a confusion about several of the lots that are numbered on the on the design that we were shown, lots one through five, and 118, 119, and 120. They look like they border on Spillane, which is going to be widened, but they don't appear to have driveways that come out onto the side streets. So I don't understand what those lots are. They look like they're landlocked lots, and I don't I think they're having access to Spillane. So I'd like somebody to explain what those lots are numbered, what those numbered lots are meant to do. Um, and I also have aesthetic concerns. If you're coming south on Spillane and you come to that Oberer part of Spillane, it's going to be widened with a sidewalk to nowhere because there's the sidewalk doesn't go north on Spillane. It doesn't go to Hyde Road. It's going to look, it's, what is that, you know? Like, and I'm also concerned, I hear a lot of conversation about cars and no conversation about making biking um, natural and, and, and accessible in this neighborhood. Um, so I, I would agree with uh, a phrase that was used by Mr. Alex Melamed. This looks like a, does not look like a 21st century design to me. I, I, I would like it to be a little more progressive. Thank you, Nina. I am really happy to see that there's that you worked really hard to get a variety of, you know, income level housing there. I, I, that's a great uh, step forward. But I, I I see this conservation style land development has not really been considered. And that's too many. Okay, thank you, Nina. Uh, so. Uh, Are you there, Selva? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. All right. So I'm I'm mostly concerned about the traffic as well. Um, a couple of points. One is that I think we're really going to end up needing a traffic light at 68 and Hyde. Um, the speed limit, I believe, is 45 miles an hour through that intersection, and nobody goes lower than 55. Um, and I believe that Hyde Road from 68 down is a 55 mile an hour speed limit, being that it's in the township. Maybe somebody could check that. 
Um, so that means people are going to be turning onto a road that's already got fast traffic on it um, with no stop signs. Again, if you're turning left on Spillan, we have stop signs here now that nobody stops for because I live right at the stop sign. And so I'm concerned that we don't have enough um, regulation now to take care of the traffic that we have, particularly with those stop signs in mind. And then the other thing was about the um, traffic volume and when that assessment was done, which I believe was during COVID. So traffic was definitely way down during the last year and a half or so. So um, I think that's pretty much what I have to say. Okay, thank you, Selva. Thank you. And Selva, for the record, can you give your last name, please? White Cell. Okay. I, I see you there, Max. I'm just looking to see if anybody else is, uh, hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Yeah. Uh, Max, I'm gonna let you speak for a couple more minutes because a couple of people offered to uh, yield. They spoke quickly to yield their time to you, so I'll give you two more minutes. If we can get you unmuted. Thank you, thanks so much. Um, and thank you everyone for yielding uh, some of your time. Um, I just wanted to make a couple uh, last points. Um, first of all, I wanna assure the planning commissioners that you're not depriving the landowners of their rights with a no vote. They are allowed to develop this property under the current zoning. Um, in order for you to give them this special treatment, this sort of special privilege, this discretionary privilege of uh, a planned use development, they have to provide recognizable benefits by the letter of your code. Um, some of the benefits that were listed in the application I don't find legitimate. Uh, the preservation of the creek, for example, can be just as easily done under the existing zoning. There's nothing about the PUD that will make that creek you know, more restorable or something. So that, that's not a legitimate uh, tangible benefit. That's it's not a tangible benefit. Also, the open spaces, including those, uh, you know, water retention areas, you know, you guys have driven past these big things and you've got one little spout coming up in the middle of it. Um, and that's a water feature, you know. Um, if, if you are inclined to allow this to move forward, get those details. What's that water feature look like? Is it, is it really make the difference between um, a big retention pond and an actual recreational feature? Um, I'd like to see the proof. Uh, but uh, even more than that, I'd like you to deny this uh, application and um, uh, uh, allow it to, to, to be developed slowly over time, just like the, the rest of the town has been, just like anybody else on this call would have to do if they were interested in developing a home. Thank you. Oh, also, I'd like to say, I didn't hear one single resident speak uh, positively. I think there was several neutral comments, several comments that asked you to take certain things under concern, but I don't think there was a single comment that uh, I would consider a positive comment encouraging you to vote yes on this application. So I uh, ask you to take that under consideration. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Max. All right. I think we may have gotten through everybody. Okay. Uh, I have to write a note to myself. Um, so uh, coming back to uh, members of planning commission, fine. Uh, and based on uh, what you've heard, how are you feeling in terms of uh, you know, planning commission, your ability to uh, 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 vote. Now, ultimately, what we're going to be voting on is we're voting on a recommendation to the village council, and the village council has a final say about whether this process, this project, goes forward or not. We look at the facts that have been, been presented to us, and we compare that to the language of the code, and we say, based on the facts that have present, been presented to us does this project meet the language of the code? And then we're asked at the end of this uh, PUD voting process to 
she was one of three paths, either either to approve the PUD application, you know, or send it to a planning commission having voted to uh, approve it, to disapprove of it, or to approve of it with modifications. And Frank, so just, uh, so we're, while a lot of people had like negative, you know, feelings about this development, we, we have nothing to do with that. Our choice is really whether it gets developed as a PUD or whether it gets developed uh, just, you know, as uh, whatever, 100 and I think the number 119 or something, 119 houses or lots. Those well, are basically, he, our, basically our choices. We can't well, stop and, and, and as I understand it, even if, if, for example, if we were to vote to disapprove of it, planning commission or our village council can still vote to approve it. Okay. Or, so or vice versa. If we vote making... to approve it, uh, village council can still vote to disapprove it. Okay. Does that, okay. Is that correct? I think I'm correct on that, aren't I? You're, you're correct on that. And yeah. if there are any modifications that planning commission votes to present to council, then they should be grounded in the code. But but the, it, as far as yeah, as far as any modifications from the plan, because you're looking at presenting a recommendation to council on the preliminary development plan and the rezoning application. But but Oberer is going to develop this land one way or the other. There's no that's that's not correct. Nobody's going to vote on that. It, it, again, it it was annexed. And the portions that were annexed came in as RA. Part of it was already in the village and was RA. Part of it was already in the village and was RC. Part of it was already in the village and was already a PUD for business um, based on the research we found. So you, you're looking at the entirety, which is multiple parcels, which again, it's a planned unit to combine those parcels for the mixed residential. Brienne, so can you also just so what Max was saying was that by making it a PUD, it simplifies the process for the developer. Is, is that like is, would they have to come to the planning commission for each individual house if it wasn't a PUD? Or? Not correct. Okay. No, they would have to follow the subdivision guidelines, but they would not have to do anything with zoning. Okay. Because it's already RA and okay. RC. They could, my they understanding could just, is they could just go ahead and build the houses per the existing yeah. code and, uh, and, yeah. and zoning regulations. Your, and and your, your decision then would be, is, is this in conformance with the platting guidelines when they, when they design a plat? Okay, thank you. And you would not have any input whatsoever into the other aspects that a PUD gives the village Again, as far as what is in the code for the PUD, the things like the green space, the affordability, um, all of the things that are in Denise's report as to whether they fit the criteria for a PUD. Because those the PUD is a layer on top of zoning. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah, Susan? Well, I think a number of people came in after Denise did her presentation. And so I think that a lot of the history maybe was lost for some of them, because I think it's important to know that this land, it was never, if it was going to be developed, it was when. The Strewings owned this land before, and their intention was to develop it. And so, you know, I know that you can live next to a field, and you love that field, and you watch the wildlife in it. But unless you own it, or unless you go out and buy it and control it, something's going to happen to it. And this land, part of it was already a PUD and ready for development. And so, um, you know, we've discussed the, the choice of having it just developed um, single family homes, and they would all be expensive single family homes. Or do we have a PUD? And maybe it's not the ideal for what many of us think Yellow Springs should be, but at least it is giving some other price points for people that are living in town, people who want to move into town, seniors living in town that want to move into a duplex. And then their house, however it is, will be bought by somebody else and are gonna provide housing for it. I also think it's important to remember 
we have the code and we do have to follow it. We can't suddenly make it up and yeah. say, oh yes, you know, I want to have a different way of developing the land. We can't do that. We have to follow what the code is. And so it's, we're going to have to go through this process and decide, do they meet uh, the different um, processes? Okay. Now, so a uh, question I have for members of planning commission uh, before closing the public hearing, have, do you think you've heard everything that you need to hear so far, at least far, as far as the public goes to be able to uh, do our voting later on tonight? I would like to hear a couple uh, responses to some of the traffic well, yeah. concerns. Great, yeah, yeah. responses to the, to some of the questions that have been yes. raised, responses from over, yes. Um, and, and, and I have, a, I have a, question, uh, a question too, in terms of if I, if I understand the process uh, uh, correctly, um, what, what, what the Planning Commission is supposed to do is we'll, we will walk through the PUD requirements Yes, and identify identify whether Ober's plan preliminary plan meets those requirements. Yes. Period. Yes. Right. yes. That's correct. okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm not seeing anybody who hasn't already participated. So, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. And now, uh, I would like to give uh, the applicant an opportunity to respond to uh, some of the questions that were asked. Uh, let's see, where are they? I see you over there uh, to the right of my screen. Yeah. Um, and specific... oh, oh. Uh, I thought that was my dog for a second there. Uh, yeah, so uh, do you want to uh, respond just sort of in, in general or the things that you'd specifically like to respond to? Sure, Frank. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how you, you want to proceed, but. I think my recommendation is we will respond to the things that we heard. And then if there's any remaining things that we didn't respond to, if you or the other commission members would repeat that question to us, then we can try to respond to that as well. Okay. Okay. That sounds, does that sound good to everybody? Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to start a little bit and George has got some pretty detailed notes. He was a better taker during this process to me. So George is okay to I'll answer a few things that I heard and then okay. I'll turn it over to George to kind of fill in the places where I'm missing. Um, first, uh, to kind of overall Max's comments, I think that was the, the one of the prevailing thoughts during the process. Uh, what um, Denise told you is what our opinion of the k k situation is too. Yeah, the property is currently zoned RA, which permits single family homes. So if turned down on our PUD recommendation, we already own the land and do intend to proceed forward with a single family home subdivision. So the difference between the PUD is there would be no duplexes, there would be no town homes, and there would be no affordable housing, um, but there would still be single family homes and there'd just be a few more of them. Um, they would still be the same styles and the same uh, offerings. So the, you know, the, the choice is, is there between the PUD and the straight zoning really is the, the variety of housing types um, that are being presented here tonight. Um, another thing we heard is some concerns about the intersection there of 68. Um, it is common and, and industry standard to study one intersection away from a subdivision, which is what we did. The intersection 68 was not studied. Um, wouldn't really hesitate too much to take a look at that if it's something that we could do as going forward. But traditionally, that road has more capacity. 68 has more capacity than Hyde Road does. So our study came to the conclusion that our, our traffic was not creating any improvements required on Hyde Road. I can't see why, and I'll leave it to Mike to detail further, but why it would come, come to the conclusion that improvements would be required on a, on a more high capacity road to 68. Um, I, I understand everybody's feelings on traffic and that's a pretty common thing to hear in our business. Um, but all we can do are the facts of a, uh, of a standard traffic study, which is what we present and it's available at the city for the village offices for anybody's review. Um, 
you know, it only can study what, what standardized studies are required to do. Um, it, to do it otherwise would not be an appropriate way for us to proceed. It wouldn't come up with an accurate result. As far as the village utilities, um, we didn't talk a lot about those, largely because we don't plan to have any impact on them. They're all being paid for by over. There's no city tax dollars going into them. Um, the stormwater will not drain towards any existing stormwater infrastructure. All the stormwater drains towards the, um, away from the existing infrastructure and into the stormwater facilities that are being created. So we'll add no stormwater to that existing infrastructure. The same is true for sanitary. So the sanitary that comes from the neighborhood goes down through this parcel, not the other way around. So the sanitary heads south. So our, our sanitary coming from our homes will not go north into the neighborhood. It, their, their sanitary comes through us. Um, and it is a very large trunk main that comes through this particular part of the neighborhood. It's always intended to be developed and, and does have the capacity to, uh, to add those extra homes onto them. Um, and then the water line, we've been told by the village that there's plenty of water pressure in this particular location. I have no reason to doubt that. Johnny seems to know his, his business pretty well. Um, so that's kind of the things I heard. Um, George, you got issues you want to talk on? Uh, just a couple of, of points, Frank. Um, Greg pretty adequately covered the traffic issues. Uh, and most of the discussion, a lot of it was about feelings about traffic. And, and, and we appreciate those. And this is not uncommon for any kind of a zoning process. But, but what Greg is, is saying is accurate. You know, we have provided the village with a, a traffic study from an expert. And, and we think uh, that they did a good job with that study. Uh, the only other point about utilities I think is noteworthy is that it was pointed out, uh, and I can't remember whether it was by, I think it was by Brienne, but uh, that the village was already committed to provide utilities to this tract before we even came onto the scene. And so we would not have closed on the purchase of the property, if we didn't intend to develop it, we normally, if it was not zoned adequately, we don't typically have made that closing contingent upon zoning. But in this case, we were satisfied with the current zoning, but we thought we could make a better plan by working with the village. And we spent the last year working with the village to make sure that we kind of addressed some of the concerns that we've heard through various meetings with staff and workshop sessions with planning commission and council. And so we think that not only does this plan uh, meet the spirit of, of those discussions, but it does meet the codes that are currently in place. Uh, so we don't think we can answer all, all the detailed questions yet or not all the I's across the T's because this is a preliminary plan approval, not a detailed plan approval. And so we've got another couple of phases to go through. We still need your recommendation. Hopefully tonight we need city or village uh, council's recommendation. And then we've got to come back with a final plan approval based on that approval. So uh, I don't think there's really anything else that I can add to, to what uh, Greg has added other than in those comments. We'll open any specific questions the commission may have to Frank. Okay, planning commission members, uh, specific questions based on uh, what you heard from the public hearing or or el or, el or otherwise. I, I have a question. Laura? I would uh, like to hear a little more detail on how Southgate complies with the active transportation plan. Oh, uh, sure. So, um, you know, Southgate is being extended basically as it was originally designed. Um, you know, the, the width and the length and the distance are going where where it was originally intended to go. If it was intended to go farther south, we'd run into Mr. Chappelle's house. I don't think we really want to do that. 
Um, so by turning to the uh, to the east, we get on this plan. Some of the connect questions about going straight to 68, I don't think we addressed them tonight, but maybe we should. Um, a, we do not own the land between our parcel and 68, so we do not have the ownership or control to make that connection. But even if we did, we wouldn't be in favor of it for a number of reasons. Um, we think uh, that by connecting struck at 68, we would actually increase traffic through the neighborhoods, not decrease traffic. Um, our current connections, you know, essentially only would encourage the people who live in our neighborhood to come through it. There's really not much of a reason for folks outside to travel through the neighborhood. Um, if we went to 68, we would be essentially creating another pass through, another shortcut. Um, for folks coming off 68 to cross through the neighborhoods. We think that would actually increase traffic, not decrease traffic in the communities. Also, there is a creek between us and uh, 68 that would have to be crossed. Um, that would require another core permit. We have a request and don't really think we need. You know, and, and yes, and George pointed out too, the existing sanitary sewer is in place. That L-shaped sewer has been there for going on 70 years. Um, and our street pattern will follow that existing sanitary sewer. So, um, you know, we kind of were finishing the layout of that as it was attended 50, 60 years ago in some ways um, by following that existing sanitary pattern. Any other questions from the Planning Commission? All right, I know it's been a long evening already, but uh, I'm, um, I'm sorry, I, guess. I just got one quick question. Uh, so, okay. the this the thing, Frank, that you brought up about, uh, and it was also brought up, managed natural landscape thing. What what's the process for getting that incorporated in? Because I, I realize what a lot of people are saying, you know. And this has been a big thing in the village is, you know, people wanting to, you know, have less grass and more, you know, more natural stuff. I mean, that's you're going to work with uh, with, I guess, with Denise or with the, you know, the the village on something that's sort of more amenable to that. Well, you know, because my initial questions having to do with, with that, and I think some of the subsequent questions uh, from the public would tie into the fact that that. Uh, my question about it originally was stemming from the language, this initial preliminary language of the homeowners association uh, agreement. And I think uh, as they spoke to that earlier, that that will have to be modified. Uh, not only, uh, well, just, you know, for example, with uh, natural landscaping to, to get it in line with uh, Yellow Springs code. Uh, Greg, did you want to add to that? Yeah, George just reminded me of something here I got to mention. You know, realistically, we are only in control of the HOA for the development period. Um, there will become a time we'll turn that over to the homeowners and they'll make their own decisions going forward. So, um, you know, once once we're, we're, we are done, um, the homeowners will have a homeownership board, a board of trustees. They'll have to be required by that board to have annual meetings um, where, where they can you know, discuss these types of things and, and kind of make their own decisions. Um, including if they don't like us anymore, getting rid of us as a management company. Um, and uh, that, that's kind of at some point in time in the future becomes their control. So we're not intending to come in here as the, uh, as the big <laughs> forever. Um, we'll come in, we'll build our homes, and eventually we'll turn this neighborhood over to the homeowners who bought the homes. Yeah. And concerning the homeowner association, um, yeah, I think a lot of what you put together is what I would call boilerplate because, you know, that's that's sort of a starting point. And, and I think even you mentioned that um, there's 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 only a handful of key elements in the homeowners association having to do with maintenance of the, uh, you know, stormwater system, you know, and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it might just be that for this particular development, there might need to be some, you know, a different approach in terms of, uh, you know, uh, yards and landscaping and trees and stuff like that and it, I, I can see that it can there could be some more discussion on that specific elements what you put in what you don't put in how you structure that within your initial 
um, homeowners association. I'm not sure how you go about doing that, but nonetheless, that seems like that would be a fit for this community. We're, we're open to that and we're happy to uh, participate in, in further workshop sessions or meetings with uh, staff that you might give them some input or direction on that we can have a dialogue with, with yeah. them. Yeah. The, the, as a, the, as a yeah. staff person, I just want to say that, you know, that's something that definitely uh, can work with over on, um, you know, over is, this is not a typical community that they would, that they normally work in. We're very unique. Um, so they're really, their, their boilerplate HOA is, is probably a very standard and accepted yeah. uh, document in, in Beaver Creek and Sugar Creek Township and those locations. Um, but um, I will share also with them the managed natural landscaping that obviously means that be less for them to have to do maintenance on or, or uh, mow. Um, and we can talk again about the chickens. I particularly would like to at least not have roosters. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no roosters. I think planning commission was, was in agreement with that a while ago. Um, it wasn't and ended up changing in our code, but yeah, we are a community that likes those things. So um, we can we can work with over on that. I have another question. It might be more for Frank, but um, I'm just not sure how how we approach this. You know, all the much of the discussion with traffic and you know you know pedestrian this and that all has to do with locations that are outside of the development. Okay, mm -hmm. you know going getting on to high road and going out, going on Spillan up and, and um, you know, going up Spillan into the village. That's sort of the village's issue. The same with going up Southgate, going up out high to 68 is the township. So I'm not, I'm really not sure how you deal with that because um, it isn't necessarily stuff that over can do because it's outside of their development so i'm not sure where we how we deal with that discussion or 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 um you know uh, uh manage those sort of questions and concerns well I, actually gary i i will point out that that is actually part of your review standards when you're doing your voting that you know the proposed project you're looking at adjacent uses of land uh, capacities of public services and facilities which are affected by the proposed project. So again, there's not much we can do on behalf of the township or ODOT, but we can look at the impacts on public facilities in terms of what the village provides and then also the adjacent areas. But again, in terms of your, your PUD review process, you're looking at the factors in 1254.06, and that that is kind of implied that you know there's not much Ober can do about them because again they are areas beyond the village limits. They are not part of the development, but you can look at the impacts on them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. We could we we identify that there is an impact on this or that. Yeah. yeah okay. All right, any other questions at this point? Sorry, there's a dog drinking out of a plant behind me. So <laughs> uh, I guess uh, we're now uh, up to the point where we start going, going through the, P, the requirements for the PUD uh, leading up to the vote. So just as a reminder for what, a little, uh, what Brianne said earlier, this being a quasi-judicial uh, hearing, that you know, we have to look at the, the facts that have been presented to us tonight, and we have to you know, see you know, you know, how that fits into the code as, as it's written. Okay. And, uh, and then at the end of the process, I think our, our basic three options uh, for voting are to approve, disapprove, or approve with modifications. That's ultimately where we'll get to. Um, and Frank, if you are ready, if you can close the public hearing before you launch. I think I already did, but if I haven't, I will close well, there, it now. There are a lot of dogs barking over here. So he, yes. he, did, he did close that, Judy. 847. Okay. 847. Okay. Yeah. But thank you. Okay, so uh, 
for members of the planning commission, but also for the public uh, section. I just wrote myself some notes here, so forgive me if I'm looking down. Section 1254 of our code uh, covers uh, PUDs, plan, unit, uh, plan use developments. And it's a long, complicated set of procedures or rules. Uh, but here's, I wanna read, just so everybody understands the, the opening paragraph uh, of uh, chapter 1254. Plan unit development district is established as an optimal development tool to permit flexibility in the regulation of land development, to encourage innovation in land use, form of ownership, and variety of design, layout, and type of structures constructed, to achieve economy and efficiency in the use of land, to preserve significant natural, historical, architectural features and open space, to promote efficient provision of public services and utilities, to minimize adverse traffic impacts, to provide better housing, employment, and business opportunities, particularly suited to residents, to encourage development of convenient recreational facilities, and to encourage the use and improvement of existing sites when the uniform regulations contained in other zoning districts alone do not provide adequate protection and safeguards for the property and surrounding areas. It is the further intent of the PUD regulations to promote a higher quality of development than can be achieved from conventional zoning requirements in furtherance of the vision and goals of the adopted Yellow Springs Comprehensive Plan and vision, Yellow Springs and Miami Township. Um, so um, now uh, everybody on planning commission got a copy and I believe it was also part of the record that got sent around of the sort of script that I put together a couple of years ago for uh, uh, voting on a PUD. If you go to, let me get my notes here. Uh, and so uh, sections A, B, C, and D of section 12, and uh, if, you, if people have their code books in front of them, I'm gonna be flipping to my code book. So section 1254.05, so go there. And sections A, B, C, and D spell out the review process for reviewing a PUD, which is kind of what we've been going through tonight. Of special note is section 1254.05C4. And I'm just gonna quote it here. Quote, following the public hearing, which we've had, the planning commission shall review the PUD request and the preliminary development plan based on conformance with the standards of section 1254.06 and shall make a recommendation to the village council to approve, disapprove, or approve with modification the request for PUD, PUD zoning and the preliminary development plan. Okay. Therefore, uh, for sort of clarity's sake, uh, I'd like you to all now to turn to section 1254.06, just a couple pages later, which specifies eight, uh, a, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and H, eight standards that, as it says, as it says, must all be met, all right, in order for us to vote uh, to approve of a PUD. Okay. Most of those eight standards are independent of procedures or expectations that were set out earlier in the chapter on PUDs, but some refer back to standards, conditions, and requirements specified earlier in the chapter, especially 1254.06 A and B, okay. especially A. So uh, how I want to proceed to vote is to uh, go to, uh, as 1254.05 C4 suggests, is to work through the eight standards that I just mentioned and then as necessary, for example, when we're on uh, A and B, jump back to the sections earlier in the chapter that are relevant. Does that make sense to everybody? So I'm just gonna try to lead us through. So any questions at this point? Or are you with so, me? Frank, you're, on, you're, on page, you're gonna start on page 18 of Denise's report, correct? Uh, I'm not sure. Is that yes. right? I'll trust yes. you. Okay. That's and, correct. Yes. Okay, so 1254.06A 
uh, uh, so 1254.06 says, in considering the PUD request, the reviewing body must find that the proposed development meets all of the following sta general standards. A, the PUD will comply with the standards, conditions, and requirements of this chapter. Okay. So uh, that has to take us back to 1254.02. You want to flip back there. Can I ask a question at this point? Just uh -huh. I, I'm not confusing you, but can Brianna, is it permissible to rely on Denise's input at this point when Frank refers us back to those points that she has already confirmed or said does not apply? Um, in the staff report, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah you, yeah, you can reiterate what the staff report says because that's a matter of record now. Okay, so is everybody with me at 1254.02? Which is page four. Okay, so 1254.02A, recognizable benefit. A PUD shall achieve recognizable and substantial benefits that would not be possible under the existing zoning classifications. At least three of the following benefits shall be accrued to the community as a result of the proposed PUD. Okay. So uh, can we identify three of these? Preservation of significant natural features, complementary mix of land uses and housing types, extensive open space and recreational amenities, connectivity of open space with new or existing adjacent greenway or trail, preservation of small town appeal, improvements to public streets or other public facilities that mitigate traffic and or uh, development impacts, coordinated development, uh, multiple small parcels, uh, removal or renovation of blighted buildings, which doesn't apply. So uh, planning commission, do we believe that this application meets at least three of those? Yes. 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 <clears throat> yes. Okay. Okay. So now go to uh, 1254.02B. Uh, each PUD shall contain a minimum of five acres. So this is already, yes. this is already taken care of. Okay. If it's less, there are conditions that have to be met, but it's more than five acres. So that one's taken care of. 1254.02C, uh, the PUD shall be served by public and uh, sanitary sewer. Yes? Yes. 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 Ownership, the PUD, uh, I'm on D now, the PUD applicant shall be filed by the property owner, and that has been done, right? Yes. Yes. 1254.02E, uh, comprehensive plan and vision. Proposed uses and design of the PUD shall be substantially consistent with the village's adoptive comprehensive plan and the principles for land stu uh, stewardship contained in the vision, Yellow Springs and Miami Township. Uh, this one, I'm going to say no, and I'll tell you why. It's, it, it's a greenfield. The number one principle is you don't do greenfield development before infill. However, it is what it is. It's a green well, field. <laughs> and, and if it hadn't been annexed, it would have been developed probably in the township yeah. anyway. Um, I don't think also with the comprehensive, and by the way, the, uh, and Denise, you know this, the code currently still refers to the old um, Village Yellow Springs and Miami Township vision, and we adopted a new comprehensive land use plan in September of 2020. So that's what I'm referring to. And, and, and I did add that in there. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, innovation, I, I guess I would have to say as good a product as they have tried to bring us. Uh, uh, some of our architects on the call tonight would probably say it's not particularly innovative. Mm -hmm. um, it, does it maintain a small town character and feel? Uh, no, don't, don't, don't jump around. Oh, on me. <laughs> oh I'm sorry. These are all comprehensive. I thought these were all comprehensive land use. No, we're, we're on 1254.02E. 
Uh, the right comprehensive land use plan and vision. Oh, okay, I see what you mean. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So okay. these, I, I actually, I think in some important ways it doesn't comply, and other ways it does. Like most of right. these things, it's both. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, how are people? Yeah, yes or no on this. I'll, I'll vote um, but Frank, before you vote on that, oh, I would note that the language of 1254.02e is that it's substantially consistent. And yeah. if you do look at the new comprehensive plan, this identify is this area is identified on that map as residential development in the 2020 comp plan. No, it's actually designated as South Transitional Future Land Use District and high de and a little bit of it as high density residential. Now, what is a South Transitional Future Land Use District? I have no idea. At the time that we did the code, or at the time we did the comprehensive land use plan, that wasn't in the village. So that was considered a future right. land use area and it was already identified by Miami Township as a future residential. So we just, you know, complying with also with Miami Township, also obviously Laura knowing that this was, uh, we were going to have to provide utilities, whether it was annexed or not, it made sense. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, any other questions about this? Otherwise let's uh, quickly vote on 1254.02E. Uh, Yes or no? I'll say yes. I'll say yes. I'll say yes. I'm going to say no. Okay. I'm going to say yes. Okay. So, uh, so then we get to uh, F, 12th uh, pedestrian accommodation. PUD will help provide for integrated, safe, and abundant pedestrian and bicycle access and movement within the PUD and adjacent properties. I'd say yes. 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 Yeah. It would, I mean, it would be great if the paths could go further, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, within the within the size of the PUD, yes. I, I'm not convinced that Southgate is sufficiently bicycle accommodating and it's on our active transportation plan. I do appreciate all the other efforts to do pedestrian connectivity, but for that reason, the first that, that I stated, I'll say no. Uh, 1254.02, uh, architecture, building forms, relationships, scale, and styles shall be harmonious and visually integrated. Pretty vague language, I think. Um, okay. I'm a, what I, I don't know that we can, this is a question of style. It's, you know, it is what it is. It's fine. Right. It doesn't, yeah. it's not terrible. Right. We don't. You don't have to live there. I don't okay. want to. I, I live in, you know, uh, a split level ranch style that grew a number of benign tumors over the years. It's one of the ugliest homes in town. So whatever. Okay. But, so <laughs> I, All right. I will say yes on this one. Are you, are you saying that their houses aren't ugly enough? <laughs> they need to look like mine. <laughs> okay. I, I, yeah, well, it's aesthetics. I mean, yes. It, it is aesthetics, and to me, it almost that almost talks cookie cutter to me. If they're going to yeah. be harmonious and yeah. visually, yeah. visually yeah. integrated, and, and that's not what we want. So, and over did make that attempt to not have it all look exactly yeah. like. So, uh, do we have three yeses on on F? Yes. I say yes. yes. And I'll, oh, I'll right. say I'll Sorry, say I'm... yes because of this language. I think it's not what people want, but the, right. it is according to this language. Yes. Yeah. Although yeah. it's still the case, I think Ober would be happy to build you whatever you want, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So uh, we're move on 1254.02H, traffic. The PUD shall provide safe and efficient vehicular movement within, into, and out of the PUD site. Traffic calming techniques, parking lot, uh, landscaping, and other sustainable design solutions shall be employed to improve traffic, circulation, stormwater management, pedestrian safety, and aesthetic appeal. And obviously we've had a lot of concerns about traffic, uh, but this says shall provide for safe and efficient vehicular movement within, into, and out of the PUD site. Yeah, it doesn't say beyond the PUD site. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think having two entrances, I think they're making it in widening Spillan, it, it does, a, you know, it meets the requirements. You know, they're doing a, putting a lot of effort into that. So are there three yeses? Yes. 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 Uh, and then finally, uh, land within any zoning district may qualify. So that's a yes as well. Uh, land within a zoning district may qualify for PUD zoning. So. Okay. Okay. So. I got all the yeses on that one, okay? So after completing the nine sections, review the results on, so on 1254.02, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I, there were at least three uh, votes for yes on, on all of them, okay? Now, please go to 12, uh, section 1254.03, because that also comes under this, later point A from 1254.06, uh, okay? So go to 1254.03. As I say in the script, uh, are you there, Denise? I think you can help us out with this. Uh, I am. 1254.03A, uh, permitted use. Any use permitted by right or conditional approval in any zoning district may be permitted within a PUD. We're okay on that one, I assume. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, 1254.03B, minimum lot size and zoning requirements. As I mentioned in my report, um, it definitely covers RC, and in most cases, it actually covers uh, a moderate density. They won't okay. be really using the high density that much, but the only place where that mattered was simply where they go to divide the... Um, the uh, duplexes for mm -hmm. individual home ownership and tax purposes, it, it changes the frontage to 47 and a half feet instead of 50 for RB. So RC is 40 feet. Okay. I mean, uh, really, yeah. Okay. Okay, so 1254.03C, Connectivity, there's uh, pathways for bicycles and pedestrians shall be incorporated throughout the development and along perimeter streets to ensure connectivity. Hmm. Are you in agreement on that one? You can see that there's some redundancy in from one section of the chapter to another. 1254.03D, uh, modification of minimum requirements. Are any modifications of minimum requirements needed for this, Denise? They they did not really request right. any modifications for that. They're right. pretty much following the standard zoning code for RC. Right, and and so the only we really, uh, the only thing they have to worry about is if they did request a modification, then we'd have to go through a list of requirements. But since they're not requesting a modification, this one is right. satisfied. Uh, so now right. we go. Uh, I'm sorry, did somebody say something? No, I just said correct. Oh, okay. 1254.03E, uh, uh, they are, are not requesting a density bonus, right? They are not requesting a density bonus, correct. Okay. Uh, 1254.03F, uh, open space. At least 15% of the area of a PDUD site shall be served as open space, and, and they have at least 15%, right? Yeah, they have like 22%. Yeah. Uh, 1254.03, uh, well, no, never mind. It's already taken care of. And then 17, or, or 1254.03G and H are not really applicable to this situation. Is that right? Because there's no, uh, well, there, uh, is there uh, existing PUD? 1254. One of the one of the parcels is is zoned as a PUD, but it is not. It it predates this code, and right. it's being asked to change it to the the entirety as a PUD. Oh. Right. Because okay. we, I mean, we we couldn't even find when it was done, except it was done prior to what was it 1991? At some point prior to 1991. Okay. Yeah, and 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 we had it as. Um, uh, residential, and I forgot to correct that because I did find one document where the PD had been was going to be uh, an extension of the business district at some point right. in time. Yeah. 
and, and uh, 1254.03H, which has to do with the Center for Business and Education, that doesn't apply to the situation either. Correct. Right. Okay, so uh, we've gotten everything checked off the list from section 1254.03, okay? So now we can go back to section 1254.06. Uh, which is back where we started, and we can address each of the eight standards in order, beginning with A, uh, which will, of course, uh, will, if necessary, uh, uh, we can review stuff. So in tw section 1254.06, again, it says, considering the B PUD request, the reviewing body must find a proposed development meets all of the following general standards. A, then we'll vote on these one at a time, okay? A, the PUD will comply with the standards, conditions, and requirements of this chapter. Okay. And that's why we went back and, and found the appropriate sections. Did it, uh, did it meet them? Now, we, we voted, uh, it voted yes on, on all of them in both of the sections. So how will people vote on 1254.06A? Has the application met with all the standards, conditions, and requirements of this chapter? Yes. 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 Okay. So that's a, uh, is it a uh, five votes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, 1254.06B, the uh, PUD will promote the intent and purposes of this chapter. I'd like to point um, out that there are about 20 intents and purposes. <laughs> I think like three don't apply, but. You know. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so it, that noted, I will vote yes. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. yes. 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 Right. So that's five yeses. Okay. 1254.06C, the proposed project, and at least now we're getting into stuff we haven't covered already. The proposed project will be compatible with adjacent uses of land, the natural environment, and the capacities of public services and facilities affected by the proposed project. Okay. Yes, I'll vote yes. Yes. I'll vote yes. Y yes. It doesn't uh, stay traffic anywhere in that. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Gary. Uh, see, I'm just looking, and um, the capacities of public, the, the one thing we've been talking about is traffic, mm -hmm. and C does not attra address traffic. It's all these other well, things. So I would say yes, also. Well, we're, yeah, we're getting, we'll come at, we got D coming up. Oh, okay. 1254.06D. <laughs> The proposed project will be consistent with the public health, safety, and welfare needs of the village. No, okay. I can vote yes on that. Yes. I will vote yes. Yes. Susan, was that a yes? I said yes. And to okay. clarify, we have to, they have to meet all of these. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So 1254.06E, granting the PUD zoning will result in a recognizable and substantial benefit to ultimate users of the project and to the community, which would not otherwise be feasible or achievable under the conventional zoning districts. Yes. 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 Is that all of us? Yeah. Yeah. 1254.06F, the PUD will not result in a significant increase in the need for public services and facilities and will not place a significant burden upon surrounding lands or the natural environment 
unless the resulting adverse effects are adequately provided for or mitigated by features of the PUD as approved. I think the operative word is significant. Yes, I think so as well. And so I will say yes. 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 You know, and so the sewer line runs right through that thing, but we never asked whether the, you know, 100 and whatever, 60 homes is going to be, a, or 140 homes is a big deal for the sewage capacity. I'm guessing so it I probably isn't. That was, but... covered, uh, that was covered in the your yeah. report, wasn't it? It was. It was. It was. I mean, Johnny Burns can comment on it, but he has told me that it has the capacity. Yeah. Okay. All right. So well, me... The only question is, it is a 70-year-old line. I think, I, I know it, it's a big <laughs> line. It's a big, big line, but you might ask him about the condition. Johnny, you want to comment? It, it is concrete pipe. It is uh, old, but it is in good condition, and we can have it cameraed if we need it to be. Okay. So, so Johnny, that was there to because this was going to this field was going to be built on. I'm sorry to get distracted. I'm just curious. It was always the plan to build on that field. Long time ago. It was always ever since I've been told about it. Okay. Yeah, that went what in the '60s or early '70s? Before I was born. It's yeah. a long, yeah. Long. Long yeah I mean, right. the, Johnny, the sewer. I mean, there was. They built a new uh, wastewater treatment plant. It used to be somewhere else, wasn't it? And then, and that was part of the reason why it went through that property that Ko owned, was right. it was a direct access, a closer access to where we needed to, where we were locating our wastewater treatment plant. It's also some of the deepest sewer that we have. It's okay, so I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to double yeah. check on 1254.06 S. Uh, I'll say yes. Just make sure. Is there... Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Everybody... Okay. So 1254.06 G. This is a, another complicated one. The PUD will be consistent with the village's comprehensive plan and vision. Yellow Springs of Miami Township. Again, the name needs to be changed. Specifically, the following planning principles shall be adhered to as applicable. Uh, okay. uh, and the key operative language there is as applicable. So there's a bunch of things that are listed there. The, the plan only needs to meet the ones that are applicable to the plan. Okay. Uh, they are, number one, redevelopment and infill locations should be favored over greenfield development. We've already discussed the complexities of that with respect to this property. Natural features and resources shall be preserved or at least conserved. Future development, redevelopment shall strengthen the physical character of the village. Quality, <coughs> quality, <coughs> excuse me, quality design is emphasized for all uses to create an attractive, distinctive public and private realm. <coughs> uh, five places are created with an integrated mix of uses that contribute to the village's identity and vitality. Six, diverse housing choices are found throughout the village, including relatively high density and affordable units. Seven, parks, open space, and recreational facilities are incorporated into future development. And eight, places are connected and accessible throughout the community by transportation methods other than automobiles. So do we think the PUD is consistent? It doesn't have to meet all of them. But just the ones that are applicable to it. I'm a, I mean, yes. The yes. this compared to the alternative is definitely better. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Although, yeah. I agree. Yes. Okay. Um, compared to the alternative, it's better, but I think it's a definitely a coin toss for me. Yeah. <laughs> Does All that right. coin to yeah. toss yeah. equate to a yes or a uh, no? <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> or is the coin still on its edge? Or is it still on the edge? Um, I, it, it doesn't matter how I vote, so I guess I'll vote no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And that gets us then to uh, H, the last one. Uh, the PUD will respect or enhance the established or planned character, use, 
and intensity of development within the area of the village where it is to be located. Respect or enhance the established or planned character, use, and intensity of development within the area of the village where it is to be located. And again, it may be well, uh, any PUD, we pretty much blessed high density. So it, yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 All right. <clears throat> so as I said at the beginning, uh, you know, the, the PUD has to meet all eight of those principles. Uh, you got it. Uh, you got the minimum uh, five votes on most of them, four on a couple of them. So uh, the proposal meets all eight of those standards according to the planning commission. So where that gets us to then is up to the point where we have to decide what vote we want to send, what recommendation we want to send uh, this to the planning commission with. Our options we can. Uh, the, as I said earlier, we can vote to approve, to disapprove, or approve with modifications. Any thoughts? Well, I, well, I think we have to approve. Hmm? Hmm? Can we, we can suggest modifications? Hmm. Can, should yeah. we do that now? Yeah, because I think obviously the homeowners association agreement will need to be tweaked. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm in favor of the man, adding the managed landscape since we just passed that ordinance. I think that definitely needs to be yeah. an option. Yeah. Um, I, I, one thing I didn't mention, which you see quite frequently, and, and I think it's both understandable and doesn't interfere with mowing, no matter what you do, is on those duplexes, and there are a lot of them, people, if they have back patios, they often want to put up a short privacy fence. So they have privacy from the neighbor's back patio. And that might be something to put in that HOA that I short privacy fences permitted between patios. And, yeah. I agree with that. Any other modifications? I, I would like the, the lighting plan to be much more dark skies friendly. Every fixture, 90 degree cutoff, post lights on the garage, on the house, overhead. They need to be 90 degree, true 90 degree cut off and downward directional and as low light emitting as possible. Okay. Um, uh, Laura, Laura's breaking out up on my screen. Is anybody having that problem or is it just my internet? It might just be your internet. Okay. And finally, I to the extent it can be made clearer how Southgate complies with our active transportation plan in terms of being bicycle friendly. I, and I'm confused there. Are you talking about the entirety of Southgate, which would then fall to the village or the PUD section of Southgate? What? Well, look on, the, look on the comprehensive land use plan, active transportation plan. It looks like it's the entire extension of Southgate. And to me, that means we want now whatever bicycle friendly accommodations mean on that type of street. I'm not a civil engineer, but bike lane on one bike lane on one side and parking on the other. Um, you know, I, I, I just don't whatever it is, it's just it's there in our our CLUP. So without going in, because I mean, I don't, you know, we're obviously not going to be able to tonight to lay out all the specifics of what should or shouldn't be included in the homeowners association. So should our language just be that the homeowners association agreement will need to be modified to be more in line with Yellow Spring standards or values or yeah, you can, you can, you can say something to the effect that it uh, incorporates 
what chapter was that, Denise? I don't know. Um, Hang on a second, I'll look it up. Well, can you say it would be compliant with the village planning and zoning code with regard to yard and lawn care? Yeah, manage natural landscapes or something to that effect. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about the man the managed natural landscape. Yeah, that's under mm -hmm. like 674 weeds. Yeah, but I'm if you're compliant with, with the village of Yellow Springs planning and zoning code, then you've got all the stuff, grass height. Yeah, I would I would yeah, say Yeah, but what I'm saying is that's not in the planning or zoning code. It's in chapter 674 under general offenses. Oh, we were okay. asked, the planning commission was asked by environmental commission and council to review that even though it's not technically yeah because it's not in the zoning code that's why i couldn't remember the yeah but it's the the reference for code. It. right yeah and so the, 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 their homeowners association is needs to be in line with yeah. with the village well can, can you something like we'll work with village staff to sure the village, HOA com, come more in line with the village of yellow springs yes uh what did you call them Managed natural landscape? No, like a whole thing. The whole. Didn't, didn't well, I mean, the values or ideals or. Mm. But I think, it needs to, I think it needs to line up with what our code allows. Yeah, yeah modif modifications should be based on language that we actually have in the code. Yes. So, for example, on uh, uh, dark skies, we actually have the 90 degree cutoffs in a different section of the zoning code pertaining to parking and conditional uses for lighting fixtures. So, we've got under 1264.03 and 1262.08 for the luminary cutoffs. And it be then requested for everything <laughs> is that a, an acceptable extension of that part of the code i think as long as we have language in the code to back it up planning commission can say we're we're basing it on the on the fact that it is in our code elsewhere yeah i think it's in the general provisions too yeah yeah okay all right, anything else as far as modifications that we'd like to like to see? Um, could we request uh, uh, an additional traffic study of the impact of the corner of uh, Hyde Road and 68? You could request it, but that would be asking for something outside the village boundaries. So right. um, I don't know that we could require it but, we could but you can request it. I mean, Johnny, John, maybe Johnny might want to comment on that because that's that's at Miami, that's Miami Township Road, and it's U.S. Federal Road, and he knows he's familiar with ODOT. I I don't know how the village can require it. I could we can ask uh, Stephanie Golf from ODOT as well as Miami Township uh, if they feel a traffic studies needed. But again, that's that's outside of our village. Yeah. No, I think there's a lot of concerns about it, though, and, and the impact of this development potentially, just especially on that that intersection. That I think it's worth requesting and, and trying to look at. Okay. Yeah. And I do believe Ober said that if the, if they thought it was necessary, that they would do it. Yeah, I think I heard him say that as well. Yeah. So. All right. Anything else? So do we have the, uh, Judy, I see you looking at the ceiling. Do we have the rough language of a potential motion here? Um, well. <laughs> to approve with the modification. The following conditions that, that, are, that, the, that the developer work with staff to uh, create an HOA document that, that is more compliant with Village of Yellow Springs Planning and Zoning Code and values, can we say that? Sure. Rianne? <laughs> sure. Okay. And uh, that 90 degree cutoff is requested for all outdoor fixtures within the PUD. 
and the other piece, you're you're not. You've asked Johnny to sort of follow up something. I see him as being a condition for over or for your PUD uh, regarding the traffic additional traffic study uh, because we don't even know where that will go. I can't I can't imagine you can legally place that on over. So uh, that's those are the only two. But we could request we could request that it be looked into, right? You can re again. You can request, but I don't think legally you can require because that right. is that intersection is outside the village jurisdiction. So I, that's why you know just go with the language request. Uh, but are, are aren't we asking Johnny to follow up on that? So Johnny, are you going to follow up on that? I can if you need me to. Okay. I do have a question. I have a question about the 90 degree cutoff. Does our code refer that to residential or just to commercial businesses and signage? Because if they put in 90 degree cutoffs and a homeowner goes through and changes it after the developers, are we going to make them change it back? I'm just not, I'm not, I don't know that the cutoff fixtures are meant for residential housing and garages. You're at Johnny, you're absolutely right. It's part of a you know a permit application on new development for you know 1264 or three and 126208. But if someone changes it after the fact, you know, that's uh it was in the design, but a homeowner or property owner is uh yeah, they can change things. They can change things. Okay. Well, so just well, there's some communities that are very serious about it, but at this stage, you know, it is expensive to change things. So hopefully it'll help protect the skies for some period of time. Okay. So Judy, what do you have? I have what I had before. I, I, okay. I, I mean, I, Johnny just said, yes, he'll, he'll, he can look into it. If you want him to look into it, I've still got work with staff to make the HOA compliant with Village of Yellow Springs planning and zoning and values. And then a 90 degree cutoff is requested for all outdoor fixtures within the PUD. Johnny said he would follow up regarding whether a traffic study was warranted. Um, okay, so I will make a motion uh, to approve the PUD with those two Modifications. Second. Second. Huh? You is uh, green. Huh? Would the clerk call the roll, please? Yes, Zaremski. Yes. Styles. Yes. Curlis. Yes. Green. Yes. Doden. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, um, now, Judy, you were gonna kind of outline the calendar for... <laughs> so, yeah, essentially, um, this cannot go to um, council until the official record is created, which means I have to whip together some minutes here and you all have to approve them. In order to get this in front of council for their December 6th meeting, um, it would be ideal if planning commission could agree to a literally a five minute meeting uh, uh, like November 30th or December 1st to do nothing but approve those minutes. Now, that means I've got to get them to you prior to that time. You have to carefully read them so that you in fact are able to approve them in, in during that span of that meeting. Um, but so I'd like to just ask you folks at this point, if you have, if, if at, least, at least three of you have the ability to make a five to 10 minute meeting on November 30th or December 1st. Yes. What time yeah. would the meeting be? Well, we can be super flexible. So uh, we could we could do 8 a.m. We could do 5 p.m. Do noon. We could do whenever you have a break that you're able to 
jump on a Zoom. Um, <clears throat> so let's say December 1st, because this is some minute, minute trauma here coming up. <laughs> Let's so, go December 1 and we say die. 6 or 7 o'clock. I, I, you know, I can be there anytime. Yeah, I could do 6 or 7, but if for staff, if you want to do it oh, during right. the day, I can do it during the day. Yeah, I can do yeah, it during I'm, the day. I could do it. Me too. I'm totally flexible. Yeah. yeah. So. How about noon? Noon's fine. So noon, high noon on December 1st. And I will send out a Zoom invite um, to all planning commission members and the usual packet receivers and all that sort of thing. And you will receive a packet, which is literally the minutes, um, probably a day or two prior to that, that meeting. So then the process is those minutes get approved so that I can get them into on December 3rd, council's packet, and then council would do this kind of all over again as they go through the process and, and have a hearing for the public because they will do that at the first reading of an ordinance to rezone to PUD. Right. But that ordinance process is gonna take as long it needs to take to have a full public hearing and vetting of the PUD. So your your you know folks are certainly welcome to zoom on to that council meeting in case you want to be available for any points of clarification uh, during the process. Then the final, the second reading and official public hearing for that PUD rezoning would be on December twentieth, and then it goes. 30 days following that, that if in fact it is approved. It, it comes back to us. No, what will happen is it, it just goes to council and then over can begin the process of, uh, of the, the um, stormwater uh, designs and other civil engineering's, the real deep dive that they need to do which they would bring back to the planning commission for final approval um, based on what council decides, then planning commission can't, uh, can only modify it if there has been slight revisions um, to the original plan. If there's major revisions, then they start this whole process all over again. All right. Uh, any old business, new business, or agenda planning? Uh, I think I have I have nothing brain, uh, on the on the on the horizon yeah. right now. I'm sure there will be, but, yeah, nothing, but nothing right now for agenda planning. All right, then I think we're up to adjournment. I will move that we adjourn. I second it. Second. Uh, all those approved say aye. 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 Thank Aye. you very much for a very long meeting and sticking with it and, and doing a good job. I hope it went all right. So thank yeah. you, Frank, for chairing what was very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank no, you, Frank. Yeah, Frank, you did a great job. Yeah. Did that voting job, script Frank. thing did that?